set? Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm calling the meeting of the Ordinance Committee to order, this being Tuesday, July 17th at 6.30 p.m. We have a crowded house. We have a big agenda. We will try to be efficient, but there's still people in line that still want to get on the agenda, so we will do our best. Um, I'm going to uh, go in order, and for those of you, there are a few extra copies up here. Okay. If Okay, so if I could have a motion to take up item one and open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Item one is a special permit application from Westfield Bank for installation of an automatic teller machine, ATM, at 1650 Northampton Street. Map 106, Block 00, Parcel 101. On the application, it states that they want to do the installation of an automatic teller machine on an existing pad used previously for a drive-up teller. All required infrastructure for the ATM is already in place at the proposed site. So would representatives of the applicant like to just run through the proposal for the committee? This is a public hearing. Members of the public will have an opportunity to speak um, relative to this proposal also. And if everyone coming to the mic can give your name and address, please. Good evening. Jimmy, you want to give my hand? Turn it on? Is it on now? Yes. Go. Okay. Uh, I'm Jim Donahue. I'm an attorney representing Westfield Bank and their petition to uh, have an ATM installed on an existing um, kiosk that they have that had previously been a uh, drive-up teller machine. Uh, this kiosk has a drive-up teller window now and a second drive-up teller that had been closed down years ago and has not been in use. So. Um, to a little bit of history about the site, um, the bank is located in a highway vehicle oriented uh, business district, your HB district. The building has been determined to be non-conforming by the building commissioner and therefore although ATMs are allowed in an HB business district because of the determination that the building is a, is a non-conforming building due to changes in the zoning bylaw since it was built, um, we need to petition the council for a special permit to um, move the ATM to the vacant drive-up window. Currently, there is an ATM that is inside the bank building. And if I could present pictures to you sure. on the site. If I could. The first picture is just a picture of the front of the bank, looking at it from the um, south going up Northampton Street. And the second picture is the uh, side of the bank that contains the entrance to both the bank and to the ATM. The, uh, the entrance is right next to the WB sign, Westfield Bank sign, the orange and with the logo. And that entrance is the only public entrance into the bank. It serves as the entrance for the ATM and for the bank proper. And just inside that doorway is the um, interior ATM that the bank wishes to uh, dispose of and then install a new drive up ATM on the existing um, teller site where the kiosk is. So the, the, um, the history of this site is that Westfield, Saving, Westfield Bank has operated this site for approximately since, 19, since 2000. Prior to that, it was a fleet bank site. And originally, it had been, for those of you as old as I am, a community savings bank site 
built in approximately 1970. At the time it was built, the bank was built and drive up tellers were installed in the rear of the property and was used that way for a number of years until one of the, the needs for the second drive up teller became um, unnecessary due to changes in the banking pattern. So what I have here are another set of photos that show the parking lot leading access to the kiosks that where the ATM would be located. So during the operation of this site by Westfield Bank for the past 18 years, the bank has been a, a pretty good corporate citizen to the community um, in the event that they've participated in and supported a number of local programs and organizations um, and helped in supporting community activities along the way. The uh, kiosk that shows the vacant uh, drive-up teller site, I should note to you, Although the teller site was removed years ago, all of the infrastructure, the cabling, electricity, and all of the other items that are necessary to reactivate that site currently exist in the, um, the vacant uh, drive-up location. So that the installation of a new drive-up ATM at this site would require no physical change to the site, no uh, digging up of the parking lot, no ins installation of anything, and just be connected to the existing services that already exist. Um, as I said before, a, a drive-up ATM is a permitted use as a matter of right in an HB zoning district. Um, however, because of the building commissioner's determination that it's a non-conforming structure, we need the special permit to allow the construction of the, uh, the ATM on this site. Westfield, currently, Westfield Bank currently has an ATM in the, at the entrance to the bank, which requires patrons and customers to park their car, exit their car, enter the bank in order to use the ATM. And that uh, would be in the area shown in photograph two. The interior ATM, if, if the drive up were approved, would be removed so that the need for patrons to leave the car in order to use the ATM would be uh, ended and there, thereby relieving some concern that some patrons have about having to get out of the car, especially in the e evening hours um, in an area that they may or may not be too familiar with. So um, hopefully that this will alleviate those concerns. The conversion of the drive up to an eight to an eight the drive up ATM is based in large part on concerns by the bank about safety for its staff and for its customers. Over the last four years, the bank has incurred one attempted robbery and two robberies um, at this site. And part of the problem that exists that they're hoping to correct by the removal of the in-house ATM is that if you look at photograph two, the entranceway is very narrow and there were no windows on the side. A two is the one with the side of the bank with the WB sign. And they're also numbered on the back, I think. Yeah, I got it. The, the, the only view that the tellers inside the bank have to see who's coming into the facility is through that narrow entranceway that creates the foyer for the ATM and then on into the bank. So by establishing a drive-up ATM, they would be able to remove this ATM, the interior ATM, take down the wall that currently supports the, between the ATM and the bank and replace that wall with safety, safety glass windows so that the tellers could see the people who would be entering the bank. And with the, if the ATM were able to be removed, where the sign WB is on uh, photo two, that sign would be removed, that wall would be uh, taken down, and a large uh, safety window would be put up there, further expanding the visibility from the bank and its bank staff 
in seeing people coming into the bank. Um, so for those two reasons, the, the, the bank is really primarily looking for the, the change to the ATM. The removal of the ATM, by the way, shouldn't have any impact on the operation of the bank or the services that are being offered since the customers who use the interior ATM now hopefully are anticipated to use the drive-up ATM so there will be no net change in the number of people entering the site to be anticipated. Also to the uh, design of the site was designed to have those two um, kiosk drive-up lanes utilized so the allowance of the ATM to be added to the site wouldn't impact the traffic flow or the pattern on the site because the site was designed originally to have two active lanes in operation to the rear of the building. Um, in addition to the changes to the bank interior if the ATM is removed, the installation of the drive up would also uh, result in changes to the exterior of the site near the ATM in the sense that the bank intends to redesign the lighting so that the areas that are sort of dark areas now to the rear of the trash uh, container and along the, uh, the property line would be better illuminated to keep uh, people from congregating or using that area. And the intent is to extend the fence uh, along the property line near the ATM, which are shown in these three pictures, if I can give them mm -hmm. to you. Um, further along the abutting property line to, to minimize any um, potential impact to the abutting property from the utilizing of that second line. Yes, Thanks. And that those photos are just three shots of the property line, different locations of the existing fence and where that fence ends there would the bank intends to if approved extend the fence down along the property line question is this is this the night drop I'm sorry, yeah i'll bring it right to you Counselor, should be a microphone. Yeah, that has to be counselor, public. Come on, you got yeah. yeah. Everybody has to be able to. Yeah. Photo two shows what we're shows a, a night drop deposit to the Talk right to. Uh, of the uh, WB uh, sign on that wall, and the question was whether that was going to remain. It is going to remain as an operation for night deposits, but the WB sign would be removed and a window put in to allow visibility from the bank into the parking lot to better view the people who were going to use it. Um, I get older, I lose my place quicker, so I have to give me a second to find out where I'm supposed to be. Oh, okay, and I'll, um, I'll let a counselor on the committee pose a question while you're looking. How's that? The, the, um, oh. the ATM, uh, in addition to being permitted under the zoning bylaws, we believe that the petition here also meets all of the criteria that are set forth for a normal special permit unrelated to a non-conforming use. The, um, that would be section 9.3.2 of your zoning bylaws. The, the social, economic, and community needs will be served by this change in that um, the safety of the staff and the customers will be improved by the use of a drive up. No one will have to leave their car in order to service the drive up. And the um, employees will be, have better control of visibility of non-employees coming to the bank or attempting to enter the bank. And with the removal of the ATM, the interior ATM, what is now a dual entrance into the bank, one for the ATM and then through the ATM area into the bank proper, 
would be converted to an entranceway solely for use by bank employees and bank patrons in an hours when the bank is closed, there would be no access into any portion of the bank proper by, by, this, by the allowance of the ATM to come in place. If you can hang on a minute, Council Lisa, you had a question? Um, I have two questions. Thanks for being here this evening. Um, the first question I have is where does the drive-through teller machine currently exit onto the lane for the drive-through teller machine? Does it circle back around to Northampton Street or does it exit onto um, James? Madam Chair. Can you can hang you, on? I'm asking somebody to turn that up so t we can get that fan off. It is a little hard to hear. Once I start if you, the, if you turn it, it if you turn it up, it won't call for the air and it'll um, shut off. Thank you. <laughs> just so um, the, f the first question I have was um, if the drive through teller and what would be the ATM machine teller lanes if they um, discharge the cars onto James Street or back onto Northampton Street? No, they, they discharge onto James Street. Yeah. The way they're designed. The entranceway from Northampton into the, the parking lot for the bank is a one-way entrance. All traffic now flows and will continue to flow into the parking lot, hopefully to the ATM teller and to the drive-up teller and then on out onto James Street. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, the second question I have is, so I hear you talking that uh, you currently are in a BH zone, business highway zone, and I'm just unsure what's creating the non-conforming use because uh, a bank should be allowed for within the business highway zone. The use is, the use is allowed. The non-conformity exists of, there's a provision and apparently Into the microphone, please. There's a provision in the zoning bylaw that apparently has changed since this bank was originally built. Your zoning bylaw now defines corner lots as having two front and two lines sides. and two side lines. Okay. And the zoning requirement says that accessory structures such as the ATM need to be in the rear yeah. yard of the building. And the building commissioner said, you don't have a rear yard, so you're non-conforming because the two abutting properties are all sidelined. So that's the reason, the only, that's really the only reason we're here. Mm -hmm. If this were, if I had a building on the other side of the bank on, instead of James Street, yep. we should have been able to put it up as a matter of right. So it's a non-conforming structure um, because of the, the two side, what's, what's perceived to be two sides as opposed to a rear and a front. Correct, yeah. that's okay. my understanding. Thank you. Councilor Leahy? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, two two qu quick questions. One is, are you increasing any of the lighting because of this? I'm sorry, what? Increasing any of the lighting? I'm sorry, what about client? What? Lighting. Lighting. What? Are you increasing lighting? Yes, the intent is to, as I said, the intent for the bank is to increase the lighting and the type of lighting in the, on the exterior of the site. There are some, if you look at it, if, you look, if you're at the bank and looking to the right-hand side, there's a trash container toward the back, and then beyond that toward the property line, there are some areas that under the current lighting are a little dark, don't get a lot of visibility. The bank has recognized that, and their intent, if this request is approved, is to um, increase the lighting to illuminate that area better, but to put shielding up on the lighting so it stays on site. Okay. That was my next question, is making sure that it's not going to bother our, our good neighbors on St. James or uh, the good neighbors who are resting peacefully for eternity on the other side. Um, so the lights are going to be directly okay. on site. What about videotape? You're adding uh, any additional protection for the uh, customers and the employees? Well, the, the, the protection... Protection for the employees is the increased visibility of seeing people who are outside trying to enter or intending to enter the bank, because right now it's very limited window. It's, it's a sort of an angled view. If you, I don't have any photos of it, but looking from where the tellers are, they really don't have a great line. There are cameras, but they don't have a visible line to see someone coming in. The, the safety increase for the patrons and the customers, we believe, is that 
a lot of people don't like getting out of their car to use an ATM. They're just, or they don't like standing at an ATM while someone is over their shoulder or walking in and out. And right now you have to walk in and out of the bank if you're using the ATM. So we believe people are leery about that. And secondly, if you could stay, if they have to, if they can stay in their car, use the machine, they feel safer and there's less chance that there's going to be any issue. Not that there have been a lot of issues with that, but it's more of a perception of safety given people's attitude. Oh, the way I look at it is right now, I believe, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, that you guys have 21 branches. Um, and it, I encourage people coming to the city hall. So if people are coming in to do their banking at Westfield Bank on Northampton Street, they're more apt to get gas across the street. They're more apt to get, you know, a candy bar down the street or Dunkin' Donuts cop. So I think having business coming in and hopefully they're withdrawing money and they're going to spend the money in the city Hoyoke. I think that's an added plus. I also think that uh, uh, the leadership under Jim Hagen uh, is a, has done a fantastic job, and I think you guys are good neighbors. Uh, I, I was born in '73, but my first uh, savings account was uh, Community Savings Bank, um, and you've done a, I think, a very fantastic job being good neighbors. Most importantly, I think you guys have fantastic tellers, and I think that's why you guys are doing so well on that street. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to ask if there are members, oh, unless you have something you want to add to the application review? OK, thank you very much. Um, if there are members of the public here who wish to speak on this proposal, please come to the microphone and give your name and address and let us know what you want us to be aware of. Hello, Hi. my name is Dave O'Brien. My wife, Susan, and we own the property and reside at 104 St. James Avenue, which is um, about two feet from, from the bank's property. And so we're here tonight to, to vehemently oppose um, the siting of this ATM. And, and the reasons for that are the proximity of that, that drive-through lane to our property, as I said, is two feet from the, the uh, asphalt curb to what we perceive as the property line. Which is the fence. We believe the property line is the fence. Oh, There's a stockade really fence there. And we have some photos as well. Um, <coughs> photos of the area. Photos of the area um, to the rear of the property where the current drive-through is sited and the proposed ATM is going to be located. Um, we provided uh, rough measurements, went out with a tape basically and took measurements and, and they're on the backs of those photos. Um, perhaps the, the biggest objection we have, because quite frankly, Westfield Bank has been a good neighbor to us. We don't mind them there. Um, they take care of the property, um, and we feel we've been good neighbors as well. Our biggest objection, again, really is the fact that an ATM is 24-7. And quite honestly, not that, not that it matters to the council much, but the proximity of our house is about 11 feet from that ATM. And it really doesn't matter to the council, but that's my bedroom, <laughs> quite honestly. It happens to be in the rear of the house on that side. And because it's going to be a 24-hour facility, it's, it's going to increase the amount of traffic that drives very, very close to, with, again, within two feet of the curb and about 11 feet of our house um, at all hours of the night. Currently. Westfield patrons that use the ATM after hours are up in the front of the lot. And typically, they drive out the St. James Avenue exit, mm -hmm. which again goes by my bedroom window. However, it goes by my bedroom window at about 25 feet away. So I guess that's probably our biggest objection. Susan, do we have any, yep. any yep. pertinent questions? Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious. I wasn't around when um, when it was built, but I'm wondering um, if it was permitted 
the structure was permitted when it was built to begin with, that it was allowed to be put that close to the property line to be, and I know Westfield wasn't even uh, the tenant then, Player, but, yeah. but um, was that even permitted? I don't know. Um, and back then there was no such thing as 24 seven banking. So, um, you know, we don't really object to, to the drive-through because there's a drive-through teller and that's fine. They operate during business hours, but 24-7 um, drive-through, midnight, two o'clock, we already have some issues as they know. Um, people coming in and they've thrown rocks at our house. We've had a, a BB shot through the window. Um, we've had issues um, because there's a lot there and kids can come in. Um, so I don't really um, consider having a drive-through um, that close to my house um, a good thing. Just the other concern, just a general Can you one. speak into the microphone, please? Thanks. An another concern, and it's just a general one, um, and I realize that, that you all weren't, weren't around way, way back when, perhaps, but what was the setback um, dimension at that point in time when that was all constructed? Because two feet sound, just seems like really, really close um, to an existing structure. Our house has been there over 100 years. Right. So it just. So can you just help me understand two feet versus 11 feet versus the 25 feet? OK. Two feet is the dimension from the, the asphalt curb, which is at the at the very what would be east end, edge of the drive-through, the proposed okay. ATM drive-through, mm -hmm. to the perceived, and I say to perceived, um, property line because that's where the fence is, and okay. we both kind of accept that that's it. So between the drive-through and the fence? Uh, between, a, no, between the, the curb, curb. Between the curb you can see and right. the fence. Right, next to the drive-through. That's, right. that's two feet. Okay. And on the other side of that is about 14 feet to our that's, window. Right. And the, 11, and the 11 feet that you asked about is from where the, the center line of the proposed ATM is to the fence. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. The 25 feet I did not measure, by the way. That's my estimation of where the cars that currently come through the parking lot after having visited the ATM and in, in the existing ATM, where they exit now. Right. And then the other side of the fence is what you're saying is 14 feet, roughly? To the yes. house, to your house. That's correct. Okay, I'm just trying to get a yeah, yeah. sense of it. Thank you. We, we found we found out about this because they were out there. They had a gentlemen out there putting in the new pedestal that they were going to use, and um, that was how we found out that this thing was going in. Were, were you notified by mail of what they were doing originally? No. Of this hearing. Of this hearing. Yes, yes we, we were. were. Yes, we were. Yes. But we, we discovered before this that they were putting this in and we complained. We went to the building department and complained because they were fixing the pedestal and they were getting ready and they put their electricity in and got it all ready to um, put their ATM in without notification. So I actually, I actually went out and spoke with the, the, the gentlemen that were doing the actual construction at the time. And what's going on guys? Oh, they're putting in a, an ATM. And that's the first notification that I got that it was happening at that location. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for your feedback. Okay. Thanks. Is there anyone else in the public who wishes to speak in favor or against this? If I could just address the uh, certainly. The one issue that was raised about the existence or the, the dimensions of the, um, mm. the uh, drive-up uh, kiosk uh, to the best of our knowledge, that was built in accordance with the existing requirements that were in place in 1970 when the original bank was, was put up. Um, and if I might, I, don't, I didn't see their photos, but we have a photo here that shows the kiosk, the kiosk and the two drive-ups along with the fence, so you get a better visual of the, the site. And what, that's one of the reasons that the bank um, as part of its improvements is to ex wants to extend the fence line down along the property line to um, address any potential, to try to address any potential negative impacts that might occur. We don't believe there will be, but it would, we would be, intend to move the fence from where it ends now down uh, to almost the, uh, 
the entrance into the uh, James Street uh, um, to assist in that. If you know, is there any ability um, with the fencing materials to have something that reduces sound? I mean, other than, you know, plain old. I, I'm not a, I'm not a designer, but I, I know that there are okay. there are things that can be done with fences, and I'm I've dealt with the bank before, and, and they have worked with these neighbors on other issues with respect to noise, especially one being the uh, the dumpster. There were some issues with the mm -hmm. dumpster company coming at six o'clock in the morning to dump their trash, and the neighbors said that's not acceptable to us, and the bank tried three or four times to correct the problem, and eventually had to threaten to fire the dumpster company if they didn't adjust their schedule and they did adjust the schedule. So the bank, I think, is willing to work with, with the, the neighbors on a lighting issue and on the fencing to do what makes sense to, to alleviate their concerns. We also don't believe that the volume of ATM traffic late in the evening is going to change from really what it is now um, just because you're going from a walk-up ATM to a drive-up ATM. It's going to be the same basic business pool, we believe, they're, they're going to use it. But anyway, thank you. Um, you, you. You need to come to the microphone, please. And I'm sorry. And yes, and address the question to us. Sure. I want to know if they have numbers on how active their ATM machine is. They should know that. What volume what, of vehicles? But, you know, they have a walk-in. How many people come and go? Um, at what time of night? I okay. don't know. Okay, hang on. We'll see if we have that in the application or if the applicant can let us know the answer to that. I'm all set. Kevin O'Connor, uh, 35 Cardinal Lane, Westfield, Mass. Um, the volume um, from about 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. on average is about 11 customers. From uh, 9 p.m. until 8 a.m., is about seven on average. Seasonality involved with that, but you know that's on average the best uh, number that we could come to for your information. During the daytime hours, it's about 40, using that in comparison to what happens during uh, the evening. Thank you. Councilor McGivern. I think the answer to what looks like a lot of questions we have as, as a body is the non-conforming use. You know, this building was built not before zoning, but during zoning. A zone change was granted, and I agree with the attorney that the bank use is okay with the zone that was given to this property. But a dimensional control is, is not by special permit. A dimensional control, if it doesn't meet the regs of the, uh, the ordinances themselves, is by, by a variance in hardship. And you know, the question I have is, was there back in the 70s a variance granted for the, uh, the current drive up the current special permit before us didn't exist back in the 70s. Uh, Drive-ups were just just went out, you know, by his attorney said by right to the use of the property for a bank itself. We we instituted this special permit for uh, for drive-ups more recently, I think, as most of us know. But I don't believe this is a non-conforming question before us. It's a drive-up question, but non-conforming should be for the board of uh, the, the uh, board of appeals itself. But it'd be interesting to see if the law department or if we could get some research on that to get those questions answered because I don't care if it's one car or two cars, if they're two feet from my bedroom, I'm not going to be happy when the window's open. Thank you. Is there anybody? Oh, Councilor Lisi. Um, so I just wanted to um, perhaps correct the record because I, I misspoke earlier. I thought that they had mentioned a non-conforming use, but it's actually a non-conforming structure because since we created the um, accessory structures ordinance we um, we don't define corner properties with two fronts I'm sorry we don't we don't we don't define corner properties with a front and a rear we define corner properties with two fronts and two sides and so that's what's creating the nonconformity in in the <coughs> structure um, it was previously uh, in accordance to all of the zoning setback and requirements and there is this requirement of a um, surveyor's plot, a certified surveyor's plot um, and from what I can understand here um, the stockade fence is within two feet of the property line so on the on the bank's property from the property line, so in towards the bank's property, um, the stockade fence is there with a two-foot buffer. 
which sounds like that meets the current zoning ordinances. Um, and then what's really before us is whether or not we think that the ATM teller is an appropriate replacement for what used to be the drive-through teller. And I think that, um, right, we're still approving a drive-through that was no longer used. Yeah. That's what's before us is the drive-through. Yeah, right. so it's really, it's just a, I think everybody's raising some, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, it's meeting the, the current zoning ordinances, um, except for the fact that there's no, <laughs> there's no rear to create the setback. We're looking at a side as opposed to a rear. Um, and then, you know, taking into consideration the, the neighbor's concerns is what we're dealing with here. Exactly. I keep that in my jacket. Sure, and I just want to... I just want to note for um, the chair's information here, it seems that another order got tagged onto the back oh, of this. Well, thank you. So we might want to separate that out at some point. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Oh, com I, Councilor I Bartley. You did, you yeah, did. Thank you. Uh, uh, Attorney Dunny, thank you. The Bryans, thank you. Uh, just before I ask, I, I, can, can we just make sure that, is, is anybody, because you're running me. Is anybody from the public want to speak before I make my? I, I've I hate, I hate asked. To public, I've asked so. for public comment so now two or three times. Okay, I wasn't right. seeing. Oh, I do see another person. I didn't yeah, see you well, earlier, but yeah. good point. Uh, my name is Ruth Copeland. I live at 95 St. James Avenue, which is across the street from where my neighbors live and down a few houses. And um, of course, I completely defer to them and their concerns. What occurred to me is that there's, they have, I think it's your beautiful uh, line of uh, juniper trees between the very end of the driveway that goes out into St. James and your yard. And, um, you know, of course, if this were to go through and you needed a fence there, that would be, I defer to you completely, but that, that, that's very beautiful. And if there were a fence in front of that, that would just make it more ugly. I, I walked through the parking lot a lot when I go on walks around the neighborhood and it would just be less beautiful so but again I would defer to whatever your wishes were so thank you Councilor Bartley yes. no. okay all right okay um, so I, I just uh, I guess uh, Terry Dunn you uh, and Teal Bryan's uh, I guess uh, I'm I'm just going to make a couple of comments, and it's my opinion that we should probably continue this. But um, w one thing I didn't hear about uh, Attorney Dunnie, well, first of all, I just want to point out that and, and Attorney Dunnie was absolutely right. He pointed out 9.3.2 in the special permits, but I'll just point out, and, and he's aware. So 9.3.3, special permits may be granted with reasonable conditions, safeguards, or limitations on time or use um, so, by the city council. So, so we, can, we can impose conditions and that's that's in the ordinance and attorney Dunning knows that uh, but I just want to point that out for the public so if we were to go ahead with this then we would probably have have to have well a lot of ways we could do it to the O'Briens and don't come here all the time but attorney Dunning who comes before lots of bodies so we can oppose with conditions we can we can deny it completely um, but as you know uh, Mr. Dunning uh, we just recommend to the full board of the city council so I just want the O'Briens to to, to realize that. So, uh, Attorney Dunny, I didn't hear anything, and if you just take a note or two, I didn't hear anything about the length of the fence. I didn't hear anything about the height of the fence. I know Councilor Vacan mentioned about noise mitigation. I think that's vital, and that should have been presented to us tonight because if, if I mean, you had to know the, 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 how proximate that neighbor is to, to, that, to that fence line. You had to know that. So, we've got to hear about noise mitigation. Um, one other thing I I'd like you to consider, there are two lanes in that drive-through. I'd like you to consider overnight hours, whether you need two lanes or whether you could possibly have one lane. I mean, I think we just heard Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, no, uh, we didn't, it was Mr. Brian. We heard, we heard Mr. O'Connor uh, mentioned that we have very limited uh, walk-up traffic. So. I strongly doubt you'd need two lanes, and you, if I, if you had one lane, you could have just have the left lane open overnight. Perhaps that might mitigate this. Then, lastly, I would strongly suggest you come back here with a with uh, with a thought or two about whether you would be willing 
to hire a detail officer or have some kind of security because if we did allow the permit with even with conditions I would want you to at least tell us I mean if this is as attorney McGivern as the counselor McGivern rightly pointed out I mean if your bedroom's two feet or ten feet or whatever from that where it's been silent for a while and you've got people throwing rocks or we're making other noise um, you know having a uniformed officer uh, whether it's private security or whether it's uh, HPD, uh, I think that would probably help to offset some of these things and maybe prevent them going forward. I mean, I, I'm just throwing out suggestions, Attorney Dunyu, that's, that's all I'm doing. But I, I would really want to hear uh, more details uh, about those things, which I, as you indicated, I know you're not an expert on fences, and you know, nor am I, but, um, but the, the, the length of the fence, the materials, I mean, we just heard about the one of the abutters saying um, there's certain uh, vegetation there that, that appeals to her. So, I mean, uh, it, will that vegetation be impacted by whatever structure your your client installs? I mean, I think we need to know this be, before we can make a decision. So, I, I would want to I, I would want you to come back with for my satisfaction um, to with those kind of answers. And I'll thank the chair. Thank you. Is there anyone else who? has a question or wishes to be heard. Um, anyone else in the public has, if you've had a thought that you want to add to the hearing? Well, I'd like to make a motion to, oh, sorry, one thing. You can push it, pull it down, yeah. Cheryl Fleming, uh, 95 Karen Lynn Circle, Feeding Hills, Mass. I am the retail uh, office uh, manager of Westfield Bank and Holy in Holyoke and I just wanted to take a second I, I'm not going to give you any of the stats but uh, I just wanted to um, convey a little bit of information um, we do have we we, we, we just want to um, kind of reiterate some of the great community things that we do um, for me it's important to just let you guys know <coughs> excuse me um, I'm very proud to, to, to say that Westfield Bank is a, is a huge community bank. We, we, we sponsor many, many corporate events. We, we do the Shriners every year. We, do, um, we sponsor Boys and Girls Club. We, we um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes too. The Valley Blue Sox, you know, we're really trying to help them um, get their tickets out there and, and get notoriety to keep them in Holyoke because we want to bring those businesses into Holyoke. It's really important to us to network and, um, and show the positivity that Holyoke has to offer. Um, the bank is a really good neighbor. We try to keep our, our community looking good. Our, our, we're, pro we're great property managers. Um, and, and we are good neighbors and so are they. Uh, and, and we appreciate them being next door and, and I think we do try to accommodate them and, um, and vice versa. Um, but you know, for, from our standpoint, okay, um, the drive up at ATM right now is in a vestibule which is uh, very difficult throughout the day for people coming and going and um, who are using the machine and, and with privacy issues, they want to make sure that they're protecting their, their card numbers and, and such, and there's people walking in and excusing themselves. Um, so that's some of, the, some of the concerns, but there's also a safety concern. Um, long before the, the most recent robbery, you know, we've, we've been talking about moving that. And um, you know, having that vestibule, we can't see from the building outside to that parking lot and the, the bank has really worked diligently to try and help us get as much visibility from inside um, you know to, to help thwart off um, robberies and just you know things happening outside that we can't see um, with that being said the drive up ATM all we were thinking of doing was moving that ATM over to the drive up um, I, un I understand um, with everything that's been said but for us, we're, we're, we're thinking that there's a lot of people that come up to the ATM that have to um, take their kids out of the car and come into the ATM after hours. Those are the conveniences that this ATM, the drive-up ATM, would, would bring. And um, 
as well as a, a heightened security. People waiting outside at night after hours uh, to get into the ATM. Um, you're standing out there waiting for your turn and you wait outside and a lot of people um, have, have told us that they're concerned about that. So they don't wanna use our ATM and so they'll go elsewhere to do so. Uh, so we're thinking that just moving that over there would be a nice, easy in and out. And, and yes, we do have, it is a one-way in and out, and currently the, the, the users of the ATM that are in the vestibule, when they exit, they're exiting the same, the same parking lot, um, and so it, they go out into the same narrow um, exit. So it's one drive up and, and I'm sorry, one driveway, and they go through the drive up and then through the through the uh, parking lot. Uh, otherwise, at night they would go through the far side of the parking lot. <coughs> excuse me, um, of the the drive up and 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 exit that that um, driveway. So I just kind of wanted to um, shed some light on uh, the good neighbors and you know just tell you that you know. <laughs> We hope that it flies. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor Lisi. Uh, thank you. The, the one last question I have, uh, be, because you have the two lanes there and are looking to fit the um, ATM into the um, lane that's not currently fitted with the drive up teller, is there an opportunity to um, swap the use of each of those um, lanes at some sort of like minimal, minimal cost? Or is it really just like totally disabled at this point in time? Kevin O'Connor again. Um, we can certainly, um, obviously there'd be an expense involved with that, but if that difference between moving the tube system that's already there for the drive up teller over to the other pad yeah. and moving the ATM to the first lane where the current drive up tube is, that infrastructure is all there because at one point there was two tube systems going mm -hmm. through. So that goes through that overhead piece from that canopy back into the bank. Um, we, we could do that if that was going to certainly assist in um, getting the permit. Yeah, I think um, at this point in time, based on all that I, I've heard, um, that seems to uh, be a solution that may mitigate the most of the concerns that are raised. Um, and then I think uh, speaking to the the concerns that Councilor Bartley brought up earlier. Um, I know that Attorney Dunning, he talked about an extension of the existing stockade fence, but to where, for how long? Like, th those are the types of questions that I think we'd wanna know. Um, and, and I'd like to, you know, I don't have the, the, the plot plan in front of me right now, but it seems like the, the plot plan indicated that the, the stockade fence is currently within the two feet buffer on your property. Um, and so if I'm looking at these um, photos correctly, um, I'm just inferring here, but it looks like the junipers that are planted are right on the property line. So it, it, it yeah, it, to me it just seems like there, there, there is the space and room for all the setback requirements to be met. It's just the, uh, the inconveniences that are being created by the 24 hour um, feature of the drive through ATM that needs to be mitigated a bit. Um, and, and so I, I'd like, you know, I just wanted to put that on the table to see if the, the swapping of the two lanes could be a, a possibility. Absolutely, we appreciate that feedback. Um, I'm not at all prepared to talk about, I'm not a fencing person, I'm a banker. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we can certainly investigate um, that piece um, for a future um, follow up. So, thank so you. I'd like to make a motion thank you. that we. Uh, Continue the table is continue the public hearing to a date certain, Second. which which I would say uh, I'm going to suggest that chair that um, oh we've got it's going to be tough uh, it's going to probably have to be October, Madam Chair, because of the uh, because of the schedule in in September. If the chair recalls, we we're uh, we're not meeting on the fourth and eighteenth as we oh and actually I'm sorry well, about that we Let's, have a we we could be maybe September eleventh. We have a 31st We have also. a meeting set for July 31st. Okay, well. Also. Yeah. How about I give him some time? How about September 11th? Hang on. We have July 31st or September 11th reasonably unless you want to add in an August meeting 
Um, well, my motion is till September 11th. Second. Okay. So we have a motion before us. All right. Yep. All in favor on continuing the public mm -hmm. hearing till September 11th? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. 6.30 p.m. So it will be continued to September 11th, 6.30 p.m. in this chambers. Thank you. Motion for item two. Second. I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Mo I need the motion to open the public motion hearing. Open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item two is a zone change application of the Colvest Group LTD for 1575 Northampton Street, Holyoke, Mass, Map 105, Block 00, Parcel 061, from current zone R-1A to proposed zone BH. So do you want to bring that in so it's facing out to the public? And maybe over here, that way we can see it also. Okay, would you like to run through the summary of your application? Absolutely, thank you very much. My name is Peter LaPointe. I'm a project manager for the Colvest Group. We're a commercial developer with offices at 1259 East Columbus Avenue in Springfield. We are the designated developer for the Lynch School property. And the first step in the redevelopment of that property is the zone, zone change we have requested uh, the entire property is currently zoned uh, residential 1A. We're requesting that the property be rezoned as business highway. Uh, the property fronts on Northampton Street, and it is basically a non-conforming parcel in the middle of a highway business zone. If you look at the print, uh, all of the, the want of another word, the pink color is the highway business zone. The green is the Lynch School property. The only non-highway business zoned parcels around us are the municipally owned park behind us and the municipally owned property across East Hampton Road, which is a strip of uh, undeveloped land and the parcel that contains the fire station fronting on Northampton Street. Uh, the, uh, we are proposing to develop the property for commercial use. Uh, the commercial uh, use of that property would be consistent with everything else on Northampton Street around us. There's a Walgreens, a gas station, a variety of retail spaces, uh, the Rite Aid, uh, the subway, a ret retail uh, uh, motels, banks, restaurants. <laughs> A repair garage and a towing towing business, uh, all of which are contiguous to or uh, adjacent to uh, the Lynch School property. Uh, the commercial reuse of that property is consistent with what the community had in mind when they put it up for sale. Uh, it was not advertised or intended to be a housing redevelopment. It was, uh, the intent I think was to produce jobs, tax revenue, and add to the economic vitality of that highway business zone. And that is exactly what we propose to do. 
uh, by capitalizing on its Northampton Street location, uh, the high traffic volumes surrounding it, uh, on the, the fact that, and its proximity to 91 and the entrance and exit ramps to 91. Uh, we are available to answer your questions about our concept for the redevelopment of the site or the zone change itself. Concept Bartlett? Well, I'd like to hear his concept for the site. Okay. <laughs> then. Or, or Frank's concept, one, one, of, one of you. You've seen this plan before. My name is Frank Colacino. Um, I'm with the Colvest Group. Uh, you've seen this concept uh, at the last uh, hearing. Uh, just so you know, we have um, we have signed the purchase and sale agreement, and all of the terms uh, have been agreed to by the uh, by the attorneys. So it's now in transit. Um, uh, between, I guess, our attorneys and, and, and the city attorneys. The plan is to build uh, 18,000 square feet uh, and an additional, I think that's 3,000 or so square feet, 3,500 uh, in the front, which we anticipate to be a financial institution. Uh, we understand that, um, that there's no, no drugstore or no um, uh, auto parts store or things like that. Uh, we understand that that's uh, not what the city wants. And so this is the first step in the zone change process to get that done. Um, I, I guess right after this, we have a planning board meeting in another week or so. Uh, and then um, I guess you uh, make a recommendation to the city council. Yes, we will need, just as a matter of procedure, we'll have to wait for a recommendation Absolutely. from the planning board. Yep. And then after that, we Understand. can make a recommendation. But first, we have to get through the public hearing process. Okay. I have a question for Marcos. Council, if we could suspend the necessary rules and invite Marcos to the microphone. Is there a second? You don't suspend the rules. He, he, yeah, he, you can just let him in. All right. Yeah, he's, he's, he's part of the process. Yeah. You can actually sit at a desk and put the mic on if you like. Hello. Thanks for coming in, Marcos. Um, I just heard the previous two speakers sp speak up to, um, you know, the community's desire to see uh, something at this site does, that does not include a drugstore or an auto parts store. And um, while we can control the zoning, what we can't control is uh, free market enterprise and what goes in there. Uh, unless we had that built into perhaps the RFP or um, could you speak to whether or not there's a guarantee on the no drug store, no or auto, auto parts store to some extent? Uh, yes, that is correct. When we issued the RFP, having had the experience before of a prior development that, um, that was targeting an, uh, a pharmacy um, that didn't garner public support, we restricted the, the RFP so that uh, a pharmacy is not an allowable use, neither is an auto use at the site. So that would be auto parts, gas station, etc. So that, uh, that those restrictions carry with the property going forward. Great, thank you. That's all, that's all that I had for now. So are there members of the public who wish to speak for or against this particular zone change request? If you are, just come to the mic, give your name and address and any comments. Bill Radner from American Rug Company, diagonally across the street from the school, and I think it's uh, a great idea. I'd be behind it 100%. So I'm, I can't wait. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions from the audience. I don't see any other questions. Councilor Bartley. Yeah, I, Marcos. Um, since you, you, you were last before us in, in, in the committee that I chair, 
Um, are there any new developments relative to this project that you want to share with us at this at this time? And then uh, I uh, we heard Frank talk about where where the, the contract is, but if you could let us know exactly from the city's perspective where where we are in the contract it's process. Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, it was an accurate description. Um, the the last parts of the language were agreed to very recently. Uh, for all I know, the mayor may have signed it already. I just don't have it with me. Um, so the next step in the process is both having the, the, the zone change. Um, after the zone change, they will be undergoing uh, site plan design um, throughout the fall uh, with the expectation that they would meet their project uh, uh, timeline so that in the spring they can, they can start demolition of the structure. And Marco, so we we had we had the applicant before the the committee that I chair. Um, I forgot the day already, but sometime last spring, and I think we had about an hour long discussion or thereabouts. And so, at at that point, we were really just discussing where, whether we we were going to convey. We'd already declared a surplus, and so the, that committee was just going to decide whether or not we were going to enter into the agreement. So the agreement still stands at. What, it's it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, th there's okay, so, there's uh, no uh, substantive change okay. in the agreement. The sale price is two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Their their reverter clause is in there. Um, it stipulates the timeline that they have uh, to to meet the development. Um, that, you know that that kind yeah, of stuff. And the only reason I'm just having you say it is because you know some counselors that weren't here for that very lengthy hearing. It was sure. very informative. And we, we asked a lot of questions at that at that point. So some some of them were, and it's okay to repeat repeat them. I mean, I I, sure. I, want, I want to be uh, the public to be well aware of, <coughs> of of where this is. So so we had at at that point we probably had the fourth highest bidder uh, before us. But the other three bidders we felt were not the highest were not the best use for the for for the property. And, and I can just say from my perspective, Marcos, I was. You know, I, I thought I asked a lot of questions, but I, I think Frank and and Mr. Point, um, I think the engineer was here too, uh, pretty much answered all of them to my satisfaction. So, I, and this is, I believe, the exact same, uh, or looks to me almost the exact same drawing that they they presented right. to us whenever that meeting was in March or April. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Um, the um, the the site plan review process. When when does that commence? Uh, it will commence once it will. <laughs> it will commence when they submit uh, a, an application. Uh, I foresee that that will take, uh, depending on where they are, where, where they are on the process. I estimate that they probably haven't started. Yeah, the, the big engineer work yet. <laughs> yeah, site plan approval will take right after the zone change approved, and then all the appeal periods are over. Then what we'll do is we'll we'll do site plan approval. That's when, you know, it, the the site plan approval, it's not just a meeting. It's um, we have to go out and do a tremendous amount of work, and that's where the traffic studies come in. That's where meetings with DOT happen. That's when we go out and and just really get to know the site extremely well. It's where's the, where water and sewer is, where drainage is. All that stuff will be designed prior to uh, a meeting. And then once we apply, all of that, uh, all those things should be completed. And then um, we give the planning board and the city council a chance to review the plans through their professionals and then ask us questions. And then we, we go from there. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Frank, because that, that kind of sums up what we, in about five minutes, what we went over. Right. The, the last time, which is the very helpful, <coughs> and then you'll have to come before a diff, if, assuming you need you, the the three thousand square foot building is is going to want a a drive through. That's correct. So you'll have to a, apply for another permit right. a, at that time. Yeah, we were going to have we're going to have to come back to the city council regardless of of, of what happens. Yeah, several more times. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bacon. Um, Marcus, the planning board, the Culver's group you know, pointed out that they have a meeting with them next week. Uh, that's we, not site plan review, though. No, no, no. It's the yeah, hearing, for, for, it's the the hearing for the zone change. It's uh, it's advertised for the 24th. Okay. So it's the same hearing we're having this evening. Yes. 
Is the there any reason we're not having a joint hearing on this? Well, for today's date, this is the third Tuesday of the month. They meet on the second and fourth Tuesdays. Is there any month. reason we're not having a joint hearing on this? I, I it, think it, I just it's, that. it's a shame. Okay. It is a shame order, not to order, be having. Can we stand point, please? Well, this is the point because I'll tell you what the point I'm making is, Councilor Bacon, is the timing of this. If the the committee closes the public hearing tonight, it starts and trips the time that you have to make a decision to allow the planning board to make their recommendation to us. And if the committee decides not to close the public hearing, it causes for a delay, and I'm concerned about the delay. Do you have a question at all? Is the committee going to close the public hearing tonight? I don't know. We'll see what the committee decides. Are there any other questions? I'm going to ask. Lisi? I'm going to really ask a, a, a brief question. Um, Marcus, could you just speak to how the zone change to BH um, fits with um, the, the master plan for the city, and, and whether whether or not the planning department sees that BH zone as a appropriate fit for the area? Well, I would, you know, I would refer to you to the, to the map that was being shown previously. It's it's accurate. Uh, the business highway zone, as the as the name would imply, is meant to provide for commercial uh, opportunities uh, off of highway exits, which uh, will cater to a large volume of folks coming off uh, their cars. Um, and so, this is right off of exit 17. Um, the the vast majority of the zoning in, ar around that intersection is business highway with the exception of course of the of the nearby neighborhoods which is residential uh so really it's a uh, it, it's it's rare to see a property this big facing northampton street on the in that sector that is not a uh, zone business highway it's it's an anomaly and that so this would expand that commercial district it it hasn't needed that because for over 50 years it's just been a, a municipal facility a school but if if the council wants to see this as a as a business opportunity then really the only zone that makes sense would be to expand that business highway zone anything else could call into question is it just a a, a spot zoning great thank you councilor bartley yeah marcos um i, I just w we just of the process what we we need to receive information from the report from the planning planning board Okay, so we, in order to receive the information, we need to keep the public hearing open. Is that true? Uh, that may be a question for the law department. I believe that's true. Uh, in order, Crystal. We don't. Yeah, I just suspend. Have to get here from the law department, please. All in favor? Aye. 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 Crystal, do, do we need to keep the public hearing open here to receive a report from the planning board? You can receive information. You just can't have any more discussion. Okay, because uh, all right, so thank you for this. So, I, I once we see the report from the planning board, I'm certainly going to want to review it and hopefully have a discussion with you and or you know, you're the, or Mr. Burkott. So, I think based upon that opinion, I don't intend to motion for this hearing to be closed tonight, Madam Chair. Okay, if you wanted to review the information provided in the recommendation, I would advise that we keep it open so that we could discuss the recommendation and, and the points that are raised there. That's what he just said. I think that's what I just said. So then you said you would like to continue, not close. That's what he said. That's in fact what I said. You said, yeah. I'm pretty sure I heard close. Okay. So, Councilor McGivern. Just a question. Can site plan review process start before the planning board closes their, their hearing on the zone, their, the zone change? I think in, in so I'll answer your question in the hypothetical but in this case they wouldn't submit their site plan application because they don't have a site plan they have to do a lot of work before they even get to that point and I think what the applicant may be suggesting is they're not going to start spending that money if they don't think that they're going to get the zone change without the zone change a project is impossible so in this case there would be no scenario under which they would apply for a site plan review before getting to a zone change. Now, could, is it possible to apply, you know, hypothetical for a site plan review before getting a zone change? There's nothing that I see that would prohibit it. The applicant would be completely at risk. And the planning, you know, the planning board can't approve a site plan if it doesn't have the right zoning. And the, the planning board would just be at risk of wasting its time. That's basically all it is. Uh, but you can't, you know, you could approve something contingent on a zone change, but that still requires council action. If I could ask a question to sure. the uh, developer, the I, I don't think it's a waste of time for a premier development uh, proposal like this. 
Are, are we on track with your schedule with the way this process is going? Uh, <clears throat> if we can get a planning board meeting uh, within the next couple of weeks, I would anticipate that sometime by the end of August we should hopefully get a, f a full city council approval on it. Then at that point we would start the, um, the process of uh, site plan approval. And it's, it's really an enormous process and it, and it involves a lot of people, not only people from our side, but it involves a lot of people from the city side and from the state side. We're, we're gonna have to have multi, I mean, numerous meetings with town engineer, uh, town DP, uh, city DPW, uh, water, sewer. I, I mean, it's, a re it's, it's an enormous undertaking and it typically is not done with a property that's, that's not zoned properly. So um, if we can, this is, it is as we discussed in the, in the uh, last council meeting uh, that we had uh, in reviewing the contract, we went through all of that. We spent a lot of time, if you all remember, in, in what, um, what we had to do. So it would, it would really be uh, taking something out of sequence to start site plan before we get a zone change. The only issue is the city council meets the first Tuesday in August. The planning board won't be, doesn't appear the planning board will be ready to come back to this committee before the first Tuesday in August. So now we're looking to early September if there's a convenient date for the ordinance committee to receive the recommendation for us to make our final decision on the zone change. 31st. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't hurt our process. Okay, thank you. I, that's, that's, that's all I wanted to hear. Okay. <laughs> Just to in, inform the discussion, the City Council will be meeting on August 7th. There is an ordinance committee meeting scheduled for July 31st. I believe you're advertised for the planning board on the 24th, correct? Correct. But after August 7th, the City Council, the full City Council won't be meeting until September 5th. So just so you know yeah. that schedule. It, 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 just, just so you know, as a practical matter, um, what's going to happen, other than perhaps demolition, uh, construction wouldn't start until spring, only because you've got the winter. You've got, you know, so by the time we get into the fall and by the time you get into that approval, I, I, I think that uh, we anticipated, as we discussed in the, in the city council uh, committee meeting last time, we anticipated a spring start for this project. And, and that gives us plenty of time to do that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this during the public motion. hearing? I just want to, I just want to make a motion that we continue the pub table is continue public hearing to uh, September 11th. So. I'll um, like to motion that we continue it to the July 31st meeting at 6.30. Is there a second? Second. So I hear a second for continuing it to July 31st at 6.30 in these chambers. What's under discussion? Councilor Bartley. Why? Because are we going to have, are we going to have anything from, from planning? We should have a recommendation if they're meeting tonight or t next next Tuesday, Tuesday rather. Like it gives could us a week po potentially. That, that's my hope. I can't. I can't okay. think of it. It's, po it's possible. We can. Great. And if it doesn't happen, we, we can, can always continue, continue again. If Great. it's not Super. moving. Super. So on the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 So this public hearing is continued to July 31st Thank at 6:30. Thank you. We already have a copy up. Can I have a motion on item three? Motion to take up item number three and open the public okay. hearing. Or All in favor? That's uh, correct. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Item three is a zone change application of People's Bank at 1850 Northampton Street, Holyoke, Mass. Map 110, block 00, parcels 104 from current zone R2 to proposed zone BL. Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Driscoll. I'm a lawyer at 330 Whitney Avenue in Hoyoke. I'm here representing uh, People's Bank in this petition tonight. 
Um, this is a project that has been in front of the council before. Um, we were in several months ago for a special permit for the drive through window. At that time, the uh, site plan that we showed uh, incorporated a property that I think you're all familiar with after the last couple of weeks, uh, 1850 Northampton Street. Um, and at that time, we envisioned uh, actually demolishing that building uh, and then incorporating that parcel into um, the uh, uh, overall development that People's Bank has proposed for the Yankee Peddler property. Uh, as you know, since then, uh, we made an agreement with uh, uh, Juan Hoyo to uh, uh, donate the property to them, and they had what a lot of people uh, witnessed, a spectacular move of a home uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that leaves that parcel undeveloped um, and unoccupied at present uh, with a zone of um, R2. Uh, and for us to incorporate uh, that parcel into the project and it's mostly used for a little bit of parking and for some um, uh, movement area for for traffic uh, we have to have a zone change we were hoping to try to find a way to do it without changing the zone uh, but we've met with both the building department and uh, Marcos and the, the planning department and it's clear that we actually we do have to have the zone change for that parcel and over for this project to go forward so we're here tonight asking for uh, a, a, a zone change uh, to the same zone district uh, that the Yankee Peddler currently has, uh, so that the whole parcel that we intend to include in the project will be developed uh, as, as a BL, BL property. Uh, I have uh, Matt Bannister and Stacy Sutton from the bank, Andy Crystal from our development uh, uh, consultant, O'Connell Development here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and uh, we just would ask your consideration in trying to get this done uh, it sort of mimics the uh, discussion that you just had uh, we're on the same time frame uh, we're here tonight we have a special uh, the planning board hearing on this zone change uh, next uh, Tuesday the 24th the only difference between this and the group that was just in time is of the essence for us. We do want to get into the ground. We want to be able to uh, start work on restoring uh, the Hildreth House and, and building this branch bank um, before the snow flies. So that means time is of the essence and we really have to move forward as quickly as we can. We were hoping to have, Mr. Uh, Council McGivern, we were hoping to have um, the a joint hearing tonight, but it's my understanding the planning board was not able to uh, conduct it tonight. So they've accommodated us by scheduling it as soon as they could next week. Uh, and uh, we would then hope if, if, the, if this committee deems it necessary to leave the uh, public hearing open, I'm not sure leave from a legal standpoint, I necessarily agree with that, but if they leave it op left it open and you continued it till the 31st, if we could get a recommendation, if we're fortunate enough to receive it uh, from the planning board by the 31st in hopes that the full city council could vote on this early August, and after appeal periods, we'd be able to really get going on this project in September. Uh, if you have any questions, as I said, the parties are here and we'd we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for the summary. I think we've all been very well informed about this project all along the way. And um, to me, it looks like a very straightforward situation. Um, does it, Council Lisi? Uh, thanks for coming down. My, my question is going to be more directed to, to Marcos. Um, I, I absolutely understand the desire and convenience of creating a continuous zone between um, the BL, BL parcel that the peddler was on and the adjacent property. I'm just wondering, out of curiosity, if the professional office overlay district extends down this far? And do you know offhand? Offhand, I believe it does, but I don't think it would apply in this situation for the parcel. Meaning what? Well, I, I guess I'm trying to anticipate where you're going with the <laughs> line of questioning. Could, could they be all set just with the pood for that parcel, but then treat the entire project under a different zoning? I think you would have to treat the entire project under either the underlaying zone or, or the overlay zone. You, could, you can like mix and match. <laughs> so, so we want one contiguous um, zone for both parcels as opposed to um, then the project could be permitted under under one zone. Mm -hmm. you, could, you can you can you can pursue the special permit under the pood, 
or you can ignore the PUD and do the underlying zone, but you can't treat, I don't think the bank in and of itself um, would be allowable under a special permit of the PUD, mm -hmm. or you would need that for part of the project site. So you can't treat like half the project under one zone and the, and the other half under, under the other zone. Mm -hmm. So this would this would this would correct it so that they could they could get the project done under the underlying zone being BL. Um, and just out of curiosity, if if they went the route of um, adjoining the two properties, the two adjacent properties, would a zone change be required? If yes. It, it, it would either way. Yes. Okay. Those are the questions that I had. Um, thank you both. Yep. Are there any members Mike. of? Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard on this project in favor or opposed or questions from the public? Seeing none, Councilor Bartley. I'm sure I'd like to make a motion that we continue this public hearing. Uh, now, normally I would have motion to close it, but I, I think there's no need to do that since the city council is meeting until August 7th. So I'd like to motion that we continue public hearing to July 31st. Second. At 6.30. At 6.30. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to take up item number four and open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Item four, a special permit application from Holyoke Gardens LLC for a marijuana manufacturing establishment, MME, at 5 Appleton Street. Um, map 049, block 01, parcel 006. Welcome. Hello. My name is David Caputo, as I think you all know, and uh, I live at 903 Dwight Street. I'm here with Justin Goldberg of 17 Ballard Street, East Hampton, uh, Massachusetts. Um, I'm the landlord at um, the former Norman paper mill that we rented out starting last April. We've done um, a, at least a quarter million dollars worth of improvements to the building and questions you have. We've done our site plan. Um, we've reviewed our, our traffic issues are pretty much negligent because with the end of a dead end street and there's nobody else there and it's in the heart of the industrial zone that nobody ever comes down anyway. Um, we're not going to have any retail presence at all. It's only going to be wholesale. The only people that are going to come to the building are our employees and very occasional visitors. There'll be no cash held on site at all. All the transactions will be done by delivery where the cash will be deposited in the bank at the end of the delivery so there will never be any cash build up at the facility. And I'm ready for any questions you may have. Who would like? Seeing none, none. Oh, I'll ask Council Bartley. Um, yep. Thank you. Uh, just, just some. Where, where, where are you with the host agreement with the with the city of Holyoke? We have executed a community host agreement, um, and we're dedicating three percent of our annual revenues as a payment to the city. Okay. Just uh, hold on, Dave. Um, Marcos, do we have a copy of that host agreement? I do. It, uh, all host agreements are the same. We have a template host agreement as we discussed last time. Okay. okay. And I, I believe that was circulated last time, no? For, this is a new it's a new applicant. Hearing. So. Yes, but I'll, all I mean, I have a copy. Oh, you mean, uh, I have you a mean, template the, copy you mean here. the boilerplate yes. was circulated? Yes, that's what I have. We signed allegedly the same host agreement as every other cannabis cultivator coming into the city. So and the allegation is true. They're all the same. <laughs> One nice thing about the host agreement is that with the 3%, if our projections carry forward the way we are expecting, we're hoping to make a million dollar a year payment to the city of Holyoke towards its general fund. Hopefully that will make us good corporate citizens. <laughs> We're also planning, just so you all know, by the end of the first year to have between 20 to 25 employees, each making an average of $25 an hour, which okay, so, is good downtown employment. Okay, so, so Dave, just, just hang back for a second, okay? Just, just hang back. Um, so 
uh, Marcos, I, I, for some reason, I just don't have that host agreement. Would you just mind emailing that to me? I don't need to see it sure. right this minute. Just, just email it to me tomorrow or something. I do now. Well, okay. I, I, I find it. Right <laughs> second, all right. Um, so, so one of the, and, and I appreciate all the uh, good corporate governance that that uh, that Dave uh, mentioned, and and uh, so I, I'm I, at some point I'm just I'm going to make a couple of motions on these things that. That these are um, that these are conditions of your of your permit. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll suggest that. Uh, on, on, and, and you can give me feedback if you want. Okay, if, sure. as I go down. So I. Um, and, and we appreciate your investment. As I said, well, you weren't here last time, but I said the microphone to the uh, to the other applicants. Don't think for a second I don't appreciate the investment. Okay. So I know you I, do. I, I know you're a business okay, person. So there's there's I, I there are other applicants here. I, I don't. Mm -hmm. remember there but they were I said it on the microphone so uh, w one of the and I'm gonna have to try to have the same conditions for for everyone and, and I'm not gonna I just want to get feedback right now that I'll make I'll make the motions as necessary w one of the ones I, I, I want to consider is is that I I, I and some of counselors and I have discussed this over the course of time how we do uh, TIFs and 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 I I've now found that there's a much better way to, to do a, a TIF, um, whereas the, the city gives everything up front, and then back we rely on a on a promise. So the city gives away all its potential to collect tax revenue, and we have to rely on a promise by a by a corporation. The mayor may not keep that promise. They may just go out of business tomorrow. We didn't we didn't we didn't pay a penny in taxes. Good for us. We made our profit and we left town. So th that is going to end um, <coughs> forever. I, I, so I'll never vote for a TIF again unless the prom unless it's turned around completely. That the city of Holyoke gets to have. So, for example, I would want to have a, a promise from your corporation that you would never. Let me just get, make sure I have my verbiage right because I actually took a minute to jot this down. That you would never. That you would always be a for-profit, tax-paying entity that in no event would the company ever file for an exemption to pay taxes. So in other words, you would never become a nonprofit 501c3, that you're always going to be a for-profit corporation. That's going to be, I'm going to motion at some point to make that a condition. You have my firm commitment so, for well, that. Well, no, well, well Dave, you, you and Justin are good. So I'm just, I'm, before I make the motion, yeah. I just want to make sure you're, you understand no, what I'm saying. I understand still. that there is okay. no plan on any part to go nonprofit at, in any way. Well, We're hoping to make lots of profits. And <laughs> right, right, and, and and I hope you do. I hope you hit out of the ballpark. But and just, we will I, I, be we will be having an escrow fund every time we do a transaction that you know. Let's just say we sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of product. Three thousand dollars, or the three percent we owe the city, will go into that escrow account right away and be held in abeyance in an escrow account until the end of the year when we pay it over. It won't be mixed into our general funds, and then we have to come up with the money at the end of the year. We're going to, of every transaction we get, we get a certain amount of money, 3% three per, three of it goes directly into the escrow account for the city. Okay, so the escrow account, the, 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 the trustee of the SD, uh, escrow account would be the city of Holyoke? Well, we were going to put our CPA in charge of it, um, Miles Kalika. I mean, we don't really care who the custodian is. I mean, that's not a big deal. We're, but we're, that's what we're planning on doing in order to make sure we don't get caught short at the end of the year, you know, and suddenly we got to come up with a million dollars that we suddenly don't have, you know. We're going to put that money aside from every transaction so it'll be in the bank whenever it comes time. At the end of the year, we just take the money out of the bank and give it to you, and it will give you a report. No we'll give you a report sure. from okay. Myers Brothers Kalika confirming all our revenues so that you see that the numbers are correct. Uh, Dave, you mentioned earlier about um, security, and I, th I don't think I've, I'm, I think the chair might, hey, might hey. have it. Um, your, your security plan hey. probably has that pro forma yeah. letter from Captain Feeball or, or Chief Nicewanger. Yeah, Chief, uh, um, new a acting Chief Feebo, because um, nice, uh, Chief Nicewanger was on vacation when we did our approval. He approved our special permit we have here um, Kevin Thomas, who is our head of security, who is a recently retired, after 20 years, Holyoke police officer. So we have somebody who's a real pro in charge of our security. Okay, and do, do you anticipate, you're just anticipate having to hire 
security? Well, right now we're going to have him because the, the city requires us we have an armed security officer there the entire time that we're open. Okay. When we're closed, there's just going to be motion detectors and cameras and other security, but there's going to be nobody coming in or out of the building at all. So they'll, you know, it's going to be locked down. Okay, and, and so I just want to make a suggestion to you, and I'm, I'm going to motion for this too, is that if there's, besides Officer Thomas, so we all know Officer Thomas, if there's a, an, a need for additional security that I would like your corporation give preference to a uh, retired well, member. Officer Thomas oh, would be in charge of oh, selecting oh, oh, the person. Okay. I'm just going to spit it out there. Yeah. Let me just spit it out. Yeah. Uh, okay, the, a retired Holyoke police officer. So I'd like, I'd like to make that. More than happy to do okay. that, and then we've hired one to be our head of security. So. Well, I realize that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, so if there's a yeah. need for additional security, I'm going to see if we can... Set, we are more sure. than happy to okay. hire retired Holyoke officers. I, we think they are excellent assets in the security department. No, that's, 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 that's really great. And um, uh, just, just, tell, just speak to a little bit about, about the charitable, uh, charitable endeavors. What, what was it that you, what, what is it that you, you propose? I'm not sure you understand the question. Well, I, I, I think you said, uh, I think you said about being a, a good corporate citizen. So I'm just wondering what, what charitable endeavors are you are you proposing, if any? If you, are you specifying okay, something? Okay, yes, you, there's a couple of things. Number one, we have uh, signed up with uh, Nelson's um, Green program that we're going to be making a committed donation to. And I've actually just founded an organization called uh, Holyoke Cannabis Philanthropies, where I'm going to be working with all the cannabis companies in Holyoke to try to organize events and focus our resources because we're going to be bringing a lot of money into the city and I want to spin a lot of it off into appropriate, um, you know, community centered events. I've been living in this town since I moved here in 03. I've really adopted this town as my hometown and I've been working ever since I got here to try to improve it and I think we've come a long way. I appreciate that. And then and then, uh, Marcos, in the host agreement, is there a provision in there relative to whether it can be reviewed, um, or is it just a forever document? Can, can what be reviewed? The, the Amen you mean amended? Is it the, the, five the, years? I, just, I, just, I wasn't sure of that, Madam Chair. It's five years. The terms and conditions can be reviewed every how long? Well, the host community agreement uh, is in effect uh, for five years because it's what the law allows us uh, to have. So I think maybe that's what the concern that you're bringing up from, from the last conversation. No, However, I the law also stipulates that uh, an operator of a marijuana facility needs to have a valid host community agreement in place. So at the end of five years, our thought is we're going to have to negotiate the host community agreement again. Even if it is to just keep the, the same one, it would have to be re renewed in our reading of the law. No, I, I, I agree. I just, I just want to, I just, I, I think you'd have it for a shorter period of time, but you had it for five years, so that's, that sounds reasonable to me. Okay, that's, uh, I just want to get that out there, then I'll, I'll make a motion after everybody else has a chance. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this question is for legal or not, but would it be um, within our purview, Crystal, under a condition um, relative to the host agreement, that if a new host agreement was not completed, before the end of the five-year initial agreement, then the initial agreement would continue to remain in force. Is that something we could have as a condition? We can't extend the host community agreements past five years. It's a strict regulation that came out of the Cannabis Control Commission. So what would happen in the scenario that one was not renegotiated in the five years? We won't period know. Ended? I mean, unfortunately, that's just something that is up in the air right now and hasn't really been decided okay um, so then I, I would presume that that we would need to renew our host agreement in order to continue operating that's my understanding of the situation that we would have to sign well, it or else we would lose whatever we're all presuming right we good business that these would all get renegotiated <laughs> at five years however the state has not decided what's going to happen at that time yet so we'd be more in line then if we stated as one of the conditions that the applicant would be required to renew the host agreement prior to the expiration of the five-year agreement. We can't do anything past five years right now. Okay. So but that can't be a condition right now. No, no. I'm saying 
you can't force them to renew past five years because we have a five year limit right now according to the state. We'll just get but they can't operate without one. Exactly. It's a catch-22. <laughs> okay. But you can't make a condition outside of what the state's requiring, which says at okay. five years. You can be sure we, okay. will, we will do everything <laughs> right. we can to renew our host agreement when the time comes. That'll be tops on my agenda. I know, but my goal was to keep it as good as it is yeah. to make sure it couldn't get worse. <laughs> that was That's the goal. <laughs> You, you have my personal commitment that I will always endeavor to give 3% of our revenues to the city of Holyoke, even if we have to somehow give you extra over what we're supposed to. I'm just saying that's, I think, a fair number for the city, and I want to make a significant... I'm going to want to look at my check that I write you every year and go, see, I'm helping. Here you go. <laughs> Council Roman? I just wanted to clarify for the council and the public at home, it's not Nelson Roman's green fund, it's the Holyoke Neighborhood Councils, based off of our discussions have been, you know, Carmen's here. Sorry if I misspoke. No, it's okay. I just don't want the public at home to think Nelson Roman is getting money directly from the marijuana. I already went down that path last cycle. I, I just don't want, I want to clarify for the public and the community. And I the, do understand. Here, the Neighborhood Associations of Holyoke have created this green fund where companies can volunteer to donate into, and they're going to go back to youth enrichment and cultural activities and festivals and it's it's the neighborhood associations carmen ocasio is the president she's negotiating these mous with these fine companies and all are welcome you can contact the neighborhood association directly but i just want to yeah. clarify for the public nelson roman city council ward 2 is not receiving any money directly from any company here in the city of holyoke for bringing your fine business i'm very excited you're coming just wanted to clarify <laughs> and and we have committed i told nelson to to donate at least ten thousand dollars a year to his fund and we are going to be trying to do a, a, a total donation to, to the fund that he's supervising. I'm sorry if I'm misspeaking, but uh, you understand what I mean. <laughs> that fund. <laughs> Thank you. Those are just impact studies. Okay. I'm still going to ask a question then. Sure. Council Lisi. Um, thank you so much for coming down and thanks for all of the um, self-imposed efforts at being a, a, a good citizen and our, a corporate citizen our, in our community. Um, I understand that at 5 Appleton there's been some issues with um, perhaps the, the soil and water and so I was just wondering how that is going to impact the location of this business in particular at the, at the location? It's my understanding that the we had a pipe break which washed out some of the um, river bank underneath the railroad tracks. But it's not even actually, the damage wasn't even done to our property. It was done to an adjacent property owned by the railroad company. And it's about 40 feet, the hole is like 40 feet away from the edge of the building. So it's really, there's no impact on the building itself. And we have a team of professional engineers that's doing a report that we'll be able to certify that mm -hmm. there's absolutely no danger to the foundation or anything. And like I said, it wasn't even our property that was damaged, it was adjacent property by the river. And we're in the middle of filling that hole anyway, so it'll be repaired within a month or two anyway. Um, and I see that from the Board of Health, there's a letter um, requesting more information about the soil remediation and how it will be maintained. So is that the, is that the certified letter that you're waiting on or? No, well, I mean, I can give, basically what we're trying to do is reuse our old soil through essentially a, a composting process. We're gonna have in a secure fenced in area, uh, three bins made out of cinder blocks essentially. And we're gonna dump our used soil in there and mix it with cow manure and worm castings and, and straw and stuff like that and let it sit there for six months and turns into new soil. There's not really any environmental impact it's just cinder block buildings with dirt in them. Yep. And, and we're just basically refreshing our dirt by using composting as part of the process. 
And so the, the soil issues don't impact your foundation at all and your, your building? No, the, the, the soil erosion that happened did not impact the foundation at all, according to the professionals that we've had there that are writing up a report that says it didn't impact it at all. When do you think you're going to have that report? By when do you think you'll have that report in hand? Uh, within a week, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. They're working on it now. Just happened about a week ago, so it's taken a it's bit. It's, it was, yeah. you know, all of a sudden a pipe breaks that's 100 years old and you got a huge flood. And fortunately, it didn't flood the building, it just ran out the side of the building and down the river. And then the, the, the composting process that you're talking about is going to be for your own use. Is Only our own use, yes. And We're just forward. recycling our own soil so we don't have to th add additional waste. You know, we're trying not to throw as much stuff away as possible. What, what we're doing, just to let you know what we're doing with our solid waste from the growing process, all of that plant material will be completely extracted of all medicine before we dispose of it. So when we dispose of it, it will be completely inert. It won't be any drugs in there at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're working with Michael Gargin, who owns Vigo Energy Corp, and will be transferring this used plant material to him to turn into biochar. Yeah, yeah. So we have a pretty good solid waste, and we'll be doing regular, we'll have a regular trash dumpster in our secure Sally Port area where we'll throw away regular trash, and we'll have regular recycling for paper and bottles and all that stuff that we'll just take to the dump separately. Um, and so I'm, I'm just getting a, a little bit confused now because um, it seems that what I understood first was happening was that um, the composting was going to be essentially recycling the soil material so that you're, you're using everything and reusing everything after perhaps remineral, remineralizing and, yeah. and fertilizing the soil again. But then what's going out to the biochar? The, the waste plant material, like the stems and the roots and it's not going to be part of the composting? No, no. We could, we could try not to add any drug material to the composting. Even if it's inert, we just don't even want anyone to think there's drug material in there. It's just dirt. There's nothing to get there. You know what I mean? And so we're basically going to send the, the, the solid waste, the plant waste, out in barrels to be essentially turned into biochar. Okay. Um... Okay, I think that's all my questions for now. I'm going to keep on looking through the file here. Sure. Thanks. Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Councilor Bacon. D David, welcome. And I, d I think to the, the city point of view, the manufacturing part of this industry is, is uh, the easy part or the part that we've become comfortable with. Um, can you give us more details about when your product is ready, your plans to how you're going to sell it? Um, our our product will be harvested and processed in a couple of different rooms in the building and then when it's ready for sale it'll be stored in a vault room that we've constructed which will be very secure and when um, it's time to deliver it we have the right to deliver our own product to an in any stores we want to sell it to our, we have um, what's known as a secure sally port area. We have an alley in the building that will have a porcullis-like gate on the end of, so it'll be secure and nobody can get in there. And it's also not visible from the street, which is part of the regulations. So we'll be able to load up our vehicle with our product, and we're, we're planning on hand, uh, hiring an off-duty Massachusetts State Police officer to ride uh, a chase car because one of the things you can't have in a vehicle that's transporting marijuana is a firearm and we think that if you're transporting three hundred thousand dollars worth of product through the streets you need someone with a firearm nearby so that's why we're hiring an off-duty state cop who has jurisdiction in the whole state to follow the vehicle and make sure nobody does anything and he'll have a weapon and and a radio if anything happens he the dispensaries that will be selling the product, will they be in Hoyoke? Some of them may be. You know, we'll be looking for markets throughout the state. We have the legal ability to sell across the state, and I don't know how much the local dispensaries will buy, but I'm happy to sell it to them first. The, um, 
you know the issue of hiring a state police officer off a retired state police officer is certainly understandable but i just want to point out that kevin thomas when he's driving a, was driving a cruiser was second only to denny egan and he can drive a chase car as well as anyone well sure i mean part of it was just to have jurisdiction to make an arrest in every city if you have a local police officer they don't have jurisdiction outside the city if you have a state police officer you do that's my understanding oh, at least not if they're retired though <laughs> oh okay <laughs> well i mean i was actually going to have off duty as opposed to retired so we're open to suggestions so, about how to nuance that but that was our best thought on how we can securely deliver our you. product thank you and um in the interest of the questions being asked about security I just want to note for the record that in a letter dated May 15th from Captain at the time, Manuel Febo, um, and signed by him as the acting chief, that he had completed a comprehensive security, received a comprehensive security plan from Hoyoke Gardens LLC for the site at 5 Appleton Street. The security plan includes the locations and details of all security measures for the site, including but not limited to lighting, fencing, gates, waste disposal, alarms, and similar measures ensuring the safety of their employees and the protection of the premises from theft or other criminal activity. The plan is a living document, therefore it shall be subject to periodic review and improvements if necessary. I hereby approve this submitted plan. Now, is there a timeline for the review of this plan? The not that I'm aware of. I mean, okay. you know, if, so just if, as they felt as needed. if the city of the, the police department says, we want to look at your plan. Here you go. Come take a look. Like okay. I said, you know, they know um, Officer Thomas. And so therefore, they can talk directly to him um, pretty easily if they need any updates on anything. Okay. And another um, point that was included was that there we will have lighting in the parking lot and the exterior of the building. We will also have cameras monitoring the exterior at points of access. Each will also be covered by a motion detector device. We'll have video of outside activity and armed on-site personnel at all times. The facility is open, which you also stated. The facility will be locked and monitored by intrusion detection systems whenever the facility is closed. Exterior entry points will also be monitored by video. And yes, and just so you know, we have two separate companies independently monitoring our alarms and our video mm -hmm. so if one company suddenly goes offline gets hit by a truck whatever there's still another company so, so, so we have a redundancy built into our security plan yes okay um i did note with the application you may have received other letters that i do not have in front of me right this minute okay but um with the original application, which Councilor Lisi has at the moment, um, all the departments that you submitted the application to are listed. Mm -hmm. There are a number of letters from different ones, including the one I just read. Okay. But there appear to be perhaps four or so other departments that we don't have the letter in the file. I don't know if planning has a letter that they've already um, given that maybe just for some reason I don't have with the, with the application. But was, if you do... It was sent July 12th. I'm sorry? It was sent July 12th, our letter. Okay, okay, so by email? Yep. Okay, so I probably still have it in my email. But in terms of the planning questions that were sent July 12th, have those been answered at this point? Um, not really. I mean, we never got a response to to, to this. I'm okay. not sure if, if there were. Well, it is only what the 17th. So, so <laughs> you're waiting for responses from your end before. Well, either either was, I mean, they don't have to. They don't have to meet our concerns. They have to meet your concerns. Well, but uh, correct. But I mean, as part we of we provide process, this for you, so that you we, so that you have a basis of to stuff that. Correct. You know, but I mean, what when raises you're, a flag but for when us. you're asking and they're answering, I mean, we're kind of looking for. The feedback and seeing the trail in terms of those questions to help inform us in our decision so right so our, our letter is. has uh, about 23 questions some of them you could probably recognize as pro forma questions that we asked they're not they're, right. they're really more to be noted there's probably around 10 questions of substance 
I don't know if the committee has the appetite of going through them one by one, but well, you maybe, should probably have the advantage of reading this before. Just to let you know that what, I would, what I would like to do mm -hmm. is I would like to ask the applicant to run through the issues that are of concern. Yeah, we have the the the, the, 10, the, the um, letter that we had with those questions. We have that completely filled out and answered. Can send it to him tomorrow. Okay. We just worked on it yesterday and came up with all the answers. We okay. just got it in just the other day. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Because we don't really want to go through all those. Right no, now. no. Well, I'm just saying <laughs> they, they, we were able to clearly answer all okay. the questions. There's no like, oh my God, what's this question? We don't know what the answer is. Not at all. Excellent. So just so that you know, when you're looking through your files, if we have five out of the eight letters that we need from the different departments, we'll be looking for the other three at the next hearing okay I mean, or to if, receive them before it sure so if, I, if, if, if I could if I could file. find out from the committee um, which of those departments are missing I can attend to them to make sure that they get this their letters so Ryan Allen is watching this and doing the minutes for this okay. so Ryan I'm speaking to you if you can coordinate with them between now and the next hearing to be sure we have everything I will call file. Ryan tomorrow and get the list okay excellent all right thank you any other questions? Any members of the public wish to speak in favor or against or make any comments relative to this application? If you'll give your name and address. My name is Michael Gargin. I live at 7 Fairfield Avenue in Holyoke. I'm working with Dave and we're also establishing a facility at uh, 10 Berkshire, it's on the corner of Berkshire and B Bolio, um, to uh, uh, process his waste and hopefully other wood from Steve Hunter up the road um, to produce biofuels and biochar um, for the local community. So ultimately we'd like to have an intra-city fuel system where we take wood from Steve, convert it and waste from Dave and convert it into carbon and fuel oil and then we'll also get a biogas which will run our system to uh, be able to provide um, not only a place for him to dispose but also biocarbon for other uses in the city. Even his soil mixtures might use it and in other areas we may be able to work with the waste treatment plant uh, it's got a deodorizing effect. It's also got the ability to pull toxins out of the effluents from uh, um, uh, sewage treatment plants, even those that have not yet become regulated like pharmaceuticals. And I've known Dave for quite some time, 20 or 30 years, and uh, I know how he's handling this. It's very well put together. I think he's got his T's crossed and his I's dotted. I also think a very important thing here is that as you look down the road five years or so, there's going to be variations in the marketplace depending on what market demand is and what supply is. And regardless of what those variations are, I think Dave's facility has the ability to respond to those more effectively than any other facility that I know of for two, three reasons. One, the electrical rates in Holyoke the water availability and the rental agreement he has will allow him to respond to whatever needs to be done to keep his tenants or his growers whole regardless of what the price of marijuana varies over time. So I think it's very important for Holyoke to have uh, facilities that can withstand whatever market variations there may be down the road. So I'm fully in support of what he's doing. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to be heard? Councillor Bartley. Oh, no, Councillor Sullivan. Sullivan. Let David go first. Okay, I have two simple, uh, Dave, two, two questions for you, two simple ones, I think. Um, I, I, gave, I gave you my comment about a, a, a preference for, um, if you're going to have additional security, there would be preference for, for, for re retired uh, Holyoke Police or, or off-duty Holyoke Police. Um, what about for non-security employment? Will, will, be, will there be a, Holyoke, a, a preference for Holyoke residents? Yeah, well, there's 
three or four Holyoke residents that are working in the team now. No, I got, I got that. So, so I think you said you got three or four now, and yeah. then in a year from now, I think you said 15, Dave? 15 to 25, depending on how quickly we're able to grow. Okay. So and we will be advertising locally and, and giving preference to, to Holyoke residents, and we have several people who are coming here that are going to move to Holyoke to come work with us. So we're getting new Holyoke residents out of this. So, so, so Dave and Justin, at the time when we come to vote I, in a few weeks, I, I'm going to I'm going to make make that motion that we that we give up preface. And then and then what about uh, you know I, I don't mean to be flip or anything, but uh, on there'll be no will it be consumption on premises no there'll be no consumption on premises just a manufacturing facility okay, now, there'll now, be no that, social now dave is that right now, is that a, is that a state law i do believe it's state regulations oh, yeah okay so so we don't have to make that a you don't have to put that in okay. the thing it's 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 a default so, uh, marcos can you, you, you can you confirm that, that that's that's a state law about cons on premise consumption well, <laughs> online online consumption social consumption or recreational consumption on site uh, is a different license so um if they for someone to have on-site consumption they would have to have the state license for that um, their application before you is for a manufacturing uh, special permit. So regardless of what they do with the state, the, the special permit before you is for manufacturing only. So it's not, uh, they, they can't have uh, social consumption on site as, as part of like a retail business. They can't because it's prohibited by state law or they can't because... Yeah. Well, right now there are no licenses for, for social consumption and those won't be issued until next year. And so. So that's on, on, on one side, on the state side, they, they, they can't do it. Right now, no one can consume as a business. Like you, can't, like you can go to a bar and drink alcohol, but right now you can't go to a, a cannabis bar and, 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 no, I, and no, I realize, I realize we're, they're not, so just my, my. Plus nobody will be there except employees. Right. There won't be any customers coming to our facility so, at so, all. So Dave or Justin, uh, would you do me a favor? Would you, um, and Dave, you can email me. I think you have my email. Or okay. Justin, you, you can look yeah. it up on holyoke.org. Um, if it is a feature of state law that you cannot consume on a manufacturing, per I, I'd want to have that specific site sent to me. If it is. If it's not, then, then, then we'll, we'll have another discussion and... Yeah, we have no plans for on-site consumption at all. Oh, it's no, Dave, I, 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 just I manufacturing. But, 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 you, but you said it was, a, it was a creature of state law, so I'd, yeah. I'd want to see the actual... We'll forward you that information. I will have Justin do that. Sure. Thank you. Um, since we're under suspension for legal, I just want to ask legal, would there be anything that would prohibit us from adding that as a condition, regardless of whether it's currently a state law or not, on the special permit? You want to have no social consumption at a dis distribution and any of, center, basically? Say we basically? wanted to just put it as a thing for any of them. Should the law change, maybe we want to have it in Holyoke that we wouldn't have it even if the law changed. I don't know that you'd... I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I don't know that you'd want to put that in special permits because social consumption may be a good thing to have in the future if the state regulates it. But in this case, his permit that he's going for wouldn't have social consumption because there aren't going to be residents. I understand on site. that. I'm just thinking ahead. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, okay, Councilor right. Sullivan. Yep. Thanks. I'd just like to uh, speak in favor of this. One thing that hasn't been touched on tonight is the uh, the building that uh, David's working on here. The uh, Norman Paper Company is a a really historic uh, landmark in Hoyoke. It has many unique architectural features and uh, some of the things they've had to deal with uh, in getting up, I really getting this thing up and running, you're talking about buildings that have outdated 600 volt electrical systems, roofs that haven't been maintained in 50 years, 130 year old water mains to deal with, window replacement, the list goes on. This building was scheduled for the wrecking ball. Um, it, it was within six months of going down. One thing I can tell you is uh, with the work they're putting into this thing, I can't speak for Tony DeLude and where this is gonna end out, but something that was producing no real estate tax revenue will be producing somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 80,000 on top of what was presented here tonight also. So I think that's something to be commended, yeah. Thank you, Mike. And Mike's been very helpful in that process. comments 
from anyone at this time? A motion time? table is to continue to July 31st. Second. Okay. 630. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Thank you all very much. Thank Take up item number five and open the public hearing. It's Second. A, it's continued. It's continued. Sorry. Thank you. Second that anyhow. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now that I can sit, it's time to stand. Public hearing for the petition of Canna Provisions Inc. Canna Provisions Inc. for a special permit for recreational marijuana dispensary at 380 Rear Dwight Street. And this is a continuation, and we raised a few questions at the last public hearing. Yes. So we'll let you give us a summary. Well, I'd be happy to. There were a couple folks who weren't able to make the last meeting, and first of all, I want to thank you for putting in your time. Looks like it's going to be another late night for you folks, and we all appreciate that. Uh, so some of the questions that came up last time that I'd like to answer, and then, of course, answer any other questions that you might have, are that uh, with respect to uh, on-site parking, and I just want to reiterate that the, uh, the plan that was presented uh, does satisfy the city's ordinance for the number of parking spaces required. And uh, the uh, applicant will make arrangements so that all employees are going to be parking at the Dwight Street parking garage right across the street. And I would also note that if there is some, you know, thank goodness if there ever was, but if there was an opportunity for uh, there to be overflow, there is, uh, I drove down Dwight Street tonight, there is uh, very, very many uh, parking spaces uh, on Dwight Street. And I've taken a look at about 10 different shots of Google Earth over the past year, and there's been no cars uh, parked on Dwight Street. So that is also available. So a couple, uh, the other question was, uh, how will traffic be directed? And so there were uh, Additional, there were additional uh, submissions that talked about signage going on that front uh, pump house building that would say Canna Provisions Parking with an arrow to the right to make sure that all the traffic and, uh, and the, the, there would be yellow lines with an arrow for, to, to direct the traffic. And so uh, on-site traffic would be uh, handled by signage. If there was a period of time where there was uh, extra, that the person at the door would come out and would become essentially uh, a traffic person. But we don't even think that would be necessary because people will drive in, and if they see that there are excess cars, they see brake lights, they're just going to park on the street, on Dwight Street, and walk in. So we're assuming. Uh, you know, <laughs> don't want to sound too lawyerly, but we're assuming the, the reasonable person uh, standard that when somebody drives down, that they're not going to, you know, back up or stop traffic. They're going to see that there's plenty of parking and they're going to use it. So that was really the main concern was uh, about traffic and about parking. And I think through the additional submissions that we've answered all those questions. So I'd be happy to answer any new questions or so, ones that you don't think uh, we've answered. Well, just because we're in a public hearing and I just want to make sure that everything is out there, we just got a fairly lengthy document today that is answering, I believe, the questions. Yeah, which are, like which I said, you, 90%. I, you, I believe you just discussed yeah. three of the points anyway. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer. I think. Some of them have already been answered a couple times, but I'm happy to answer okay. anything uh, else that you may have. This is the continued, so this is the second public hearing. Correct. So I just want to give members of the committee a couple minutes because a lot of us work during the day. We got it this afternoon, but I didn't have time to 
look it over. So we don't like to ask you things over and over, but on oh, the no, other no. hand. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. If you, if you like, I could kind of run through the letter pretty quickly if, that would, if you think that would be helpful. Well, yeah. I think it would be helpful to just hit the high points of it, and it will be, you know, as a matter of record in the file, but I just think in the interest of a public hearing, it would be good just to have the main points yep. answered. So, so if, if, if you'll uh, you know, allow me, question number one was sure. what's the most recent submission? And it was uh, June 19th. Uh, so the question number two was about providing a 1972 stamp on sheets. Uh, so the, uh, that will be on the final plans that are submitted. That, that, that 1972 stamp is no secret. It's been on documents that you've seen. Mm -hmm. It's just that planning asks that it also be superimposed on oh. other documents. So it's just taking a stamp you've seen and putting it other places. No problem. Question three, uh, there were no additional comments by planning, so that's complete. Question four, uh, so uh, planning wanted actual sites to Google Earth, and we'll certainly submit those uh, when it comes time for um, for uh, asking for a building permit. I, I don't think anybody, I mean, we go on Google Earth, right. we know what it is. I don't think we need to right. see the ISP or whatever uh, number. Uh, question five was about the 72 stamp again. Uh, question six was about Google Earth again. Question seven was about the guard that I talked about, and we really don't think it'll be necessary. And question seven sort of goes on uh, quite a bit uh, about that. And so question eight also refers to the guard and traffic control. Question nine, uh, Noah Butter has given us any concerns about uh, anything at all, actually. The neighbors are very happy to have somebody come in, spend money next door. It's like somebody moving next door to my house putting on new siding, new windows, new roof, and making it more valuable. It makes, makes my house more valuable. Uh, number 10 also uh, is very lengthy, but it, it, I just summarized it about the whole traffic parking thing. Question 11 uh, is about the dispersion of light. And I would respectfully suggest that if you've been at 380R Dwight Street at night, you want as much light as possible. Um, so, and none of the neighbors have said that they're concerned about any, you know, light spillage or anything like that. But, of course, the you know the lights will be uh, so that they go down into the traffic areas, into the parking areas, and they will. Everybody wants to be safe, and so that will uh, happen. Number twelve, there were no new comments. Thirteen, no new comments. Fourteen. Uh, talking about traffic again, so there will be painting for circulation. 15, uh, the windows will be up to code, basically. Uh, 16 is about the 1972 stamp. Uh, and uh, 17, the plantings, uh, we put an attachment of the uh, wood planter boxes at the end. Uh, 18, no, nothing additional. Uh, 19, uh, so we've already submitted everything with respect to parking space, uh, striping, crosswalk striping, uh, fencing, uh, et cetera. So all of the site details have been provided. 20, 20, there was no, 21, 20, 20, 21, and 22, there were no new questions. And so uh, hopefully uh, this answers everything that uh, you have, and I'm happy if you have something else, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you. I appreciate you running quickly through that. It is helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Um, any members of the committee have any? Council Bartley. Jack, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Okay, uh, Jack, what, what, are, what are our hours operation proposed? Uh, 8 to 10. I'm sorry, 8 to 8. Yep, yeah, so the ordinance talks about eight to eight and that's what the original application uh, so eight to eight and then yeah. what, what what days uh seven days a week seven days a week yes okay allowed by the ordinance and i think you might have been for the earlier um public hearing uh, i i would there be any any uh thought about ever 
changing the the legal structure of the entity to a nonprofit? No, no. The, you know, once again, uh, this is a for-profit enterprise. The, the medical model required a nonprofit, but you'll notice uh, that even the medical companies now are changing to for-profit because medical companies are allowed now to be for-profit. I'm just talking about the the, the 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 property owner, not not. So so who just give me, who, what, what entity owns the building? Uh, Canna Provisions has a, a long-term lease uh, for the space that is going to be the dispensary. And the entity that owns the building is a for-profit? Yes. Okay. So is your client okay with a provision that Canna solely leases from a for-profit Operation? I, yeah, I don't think you can regulate what. Uh, I, I owner... just, I, 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 Jack, I'm not asking what your opinion right now. I'm just asking. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I have my own opinion on this, but yeah. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. But would, so would, your, could, would your... could we agree to that? No, because we have no control over the landlord. So the landlord. So with a dispensary, I don't think. I mean, you can ask your own lawyer. But with a dispensary as a tenant, I don't think you could turn a building into a not-for-profit because it's collecting rent. Mm. I don't think you could take, you know, there's, there's five reasons why you can become a 501c3. <laughs> and renting to a for-profit tenant is not one of the reasons why you can become a 501c3. Educational, health, uh, you know, there's, there's five of them. Why you can become a non-profit. So we, I think we could have a friendly condition that the dispensary be for profit. Yeah, but we I, have I, we have no control I, over I, our landlord. Yeah, I'm just I'm just more interested that the city is able to collect property tax and that we're, that we're not we're not we're not burdened with with another nonprofit that doesn't pay property tax. So I agree. so why would I? Why I see all sorts of people raising their hands, but just hold on a sec. So, um, so we'll. So my, my my thought was that if if your company's gonna, you have a long term lease, which I I think you might have even provided a copy. I don't remember if you did or not. But how long is the lease? We did. We did. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's uh, five years with two five year options. Okay. So fifteen years basically. All right. But is it is the owner of the property separate and distinct from your client? Yes. So, so, so no, no, um, it's not a related party in any way. Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. All right. So I, I would want to, and again, I'm just one person, so I mean, I, I know all sorts of people raise their hands and all that, but uh, I, I would want it, I mean, I would want it to be a condition that, that who's ever in there, whoever owns real property, whether it's, and whether they're the vendor or whether they're the lessor, I'd want to make sure that the owner of the real property is always a for-profit corporation so that the city of Holyoke doesn't have to rely on, on a promise that we can, we can put that as a condition. I, I would ask your lawyer if you can do that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to go, you, know, you have to talk to the chair about this. So, all right, so I'm, I'm thank you. Well, well, let me just let me just rattle off a couple of the ones because that was in a holding pattern right now. Um, Jack, the a couple of the ones I mentioned were um, consumption not on site. I, I, so we're we're asking for a dispensary license from the state, and that does not permit on site consumption. Uh, okay, so uh, I I think I heard your answer there. So you're you're okay with it. So um, for em employment. Um, we would give a preference. We're working with Gladys and Career Point. Oh, and great. So, yep. So we would definitely, to the extent possible, you know, to you, to the extent extent you can get qualified people. Yes, we'd hire uh, Holyoke residents. So we, and we to the we, extent that we need to hire security people, we uh, do our best to get retired uh, Holyoke uh, officers so, so if, who if know I, the, who know the terrain and the neighborhood. Right. So if if we motion to make that a condition of special permit, that you know, your your client would 
Yeah, I mean, a best efforts thing. I mean, we, we can't close the doors because we can't find a qualified applicant. So I think, no, I think everybody's I, just I, looking right. for I, I, best I, I, I think we're, we're trying to, it, it, to the extent we can, we're trying to advocate for Holyoke's because if, if we're going to have the burden of all this, and, and, and I, I, don't mean, I don't mean that in a mean way, but it's just going to be, it's a, it's, a, it's a different industry. It's a very unique industry. As you know, half, half the Commonwealth cities and towns do not want it. They voted explicitly against it, and they barred it. So, so it's. I'm not saying it's going to be a burden in a hard in a hard way, but it's, it's when something is unique and different. Um, to to have a, a a condition like that for um, a preference for local residents, it's a, whatever language you can put in and make it as stern as possible, then I would be all for that. So. So yeah, I think a, a best efforts provision would be, you know, completely appropriate. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll think of something. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I, that, that'll I'm be. Not, I'm not, but be be fair to all parties. Yeah, I would never put words in your mouth, Council. Uh, I know you wouldn't. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Council Roman. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, that last back and forth was interesting. I thank my colleague, Councilor Bartley, for asking those lines of questions. Um, a few things that I just wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It, and kind of, uh, you had a community outreach meeting clearly. How many residents attended? None. None, okay. So, um, we had it at Gateway, and so we of course, kind of yep, no, 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 thank no, no. you. So, no, so, that was just yes or no. no I don't, just go wanna, there, don't, don't go there at Gateway. I just, wanna, <laughs> I just wanted to make a statement because I talked to the commissioner, uh, and this is just for all the industry because I said it at the last industry summit I was at. Uh, I really take umbrage with these companies coming in here just doing stuff at Gateway, and then I always ask the three questions. What newspapers did you advertise in? Were they all in English? How many English flyers did you get? Did you go around to the neighborhoods that are abutting? And with regards to the last statement around jobs, Madam Chairwin, I really want all the companies who are here tonight to hear me clearly. If it was up to me, I would put a condition that half of your workers have to be from this community, 50%, because in the neighborhoods where these companies are opening, South Holyoke's average annual income is 14,300, and the unemployment rate is higher than the cities, way higher than the cities. Um, uh, I won't say the incorrect number again, but I will know it's very higher. And the flats is, again, one of the lowest two income streams are from the neighborhoods that you all are coming into. So I really take umbrage with the, oh, we'll try the best to hire local. And I'll just share that the last company that did their big job fair at Gateway City Arts, right, and hundreds of people showed up, came to our door to ask the Neighborhood Association to try to find local folks, because they're struggling to find them. So I would like to see from you all as an industry, right, and I, like I said, I'm the pro marijuana guy, I, I'm a user, I'm out there. A more consorted effort because career point, yes, is great, um, as is going through the traditional channels, but I'm really expecting you all to step up more. And having community meetings with zero participants is unacceptable in my opinion. Unacceptable. So I really want you guys to go back out there because there are folks out there, but again, they need to be in Spanish. Did you advertise in Spanish? Were your flyers in Spanish? How did you get the word out? Um, and that is not a, an okay condition for me. So I, if it was up to me and I'm gonna try to pass it as a condition, I want stronger hiring practices because I was just as tough on GTI when they were in front of us because in a city of 40,000 people, for you to just say, oh, we'll try our hardest, and, and with all due respect, I've heard this from companies before, we're gonna try our hardest, that's unacceptable to me, when you have two neighborhoods where we zone that this is where the industry's coming into is in the most need of employment. And there are other examples, and I'm not gonna call them out individually, of companies that I'm seeing that are really making a consorted effort to go out there. So I just want all of you to hear across the board, so you, you don't jack in your clients, I don't want you to feel like it's just you all across the board. When you come before me as a counselor, looking for these this employment I love my colleague for putting this provision in I'm gonna try to and again I'll try it might not pass but I'm gonna put for stronger hiring provisions because if that's the one thing we can control is to help the city with whatever that little seven or six percent unemployment rate that the you know administration likes to tell but in these neighborhoods and in these communities where those unemployment rates are higher or like I said the average annual income 14,300 in South Holyoke these $15 an hour jobs are gonna be life changing. And that's what's gonna be the difference from these folks moving up the economic ladder or staying there. So I don't accept that, oh, we're gonna try our hardest or oh, we're working with just this organization or that organization and hopefully we'll get the qualified applicants we need. I really want everyone to step up more with regards to that. And I'm hoping you're welcoming to a little bit more, uh, I would like to see it even more stronger than just a, oh, we'll try to say, no, we're committing to that. We're gonna to commit to hiring 50% in Holyoke. We're gonna commit and go out every day, because as you said, and we heard from the last applicant we have people moving into Holyoke great wonderful and there's still a large base of individuals who are in need of employment here so I cannot wait to support my colleagues uh, special condition 
Uh, I'm going to try to make it a little bit stronger. Um, and with regards to the law department and consumption, um, as we see, because yes, this administration has some you know laws before us, I would love to see, I'm one of those folks who would love to see social consumption. I think the state commission has to get their act together, but with regards to that stuff, um, I'm just also concerned that you know the state could switch their regulations tomorrow. Um, I know it's not banned, but you know, I do have some of those concerns that my colleagues have around social consumption, um, but I do want to see it come to Holyoke. I think it's going to be the wave of the future. Um, but I just wanted to uh, always ask, because I'm going to keep asking everyone, how many uh, committees, I mean, how many neighborhood outreach meetings did you have, and how many people did you came? Thanks for asking that. Um, and I do want to see stronger provisions, like my colleagues saying. Um, and around hours of operation, uh, I know the ordinance says eight to eight, um, but we, you know, I'm just concerned about like Sundays and weekends and, you know, that's the biggest thing that I've gotten is traffic overall because all these companies are opening along Main Street from like all the way down Springdale to all the way up to the South Hadley Bridge. So folks in the neighborhoods are in, in the communities are really concerned about traffic flow and impact, uh, especially on nights and weekends. So uh, I'm going to listen to feedback. I'm going to go back to the community because I've just finished talking with Izzy Rivera today um, and we were talking about all these companies. We literally did a dotted map. And they're like all oh, sparkling along Main Street. I love it. That's great. Uh, but we do have impact concerns about traffic. And we want to see stronger employment provisions. So I hope the industry is open to that. Because I know there's a lot of you here tonight from the industry. I hope you would be willing to agree to more. And again, I know 50% was like a high number. I know I'm crazy for asking that. But um, I would love to see more of a stronger, more definitive number for employment. Thank you. Nelson, can I just say for the record that our preference is to hire Holyoke people? Jack, thank you. And I continue to hear from industries and companies, my preference is Holyoke. And as a man of color who was homeless, with all due respect to you, I used to go into that career point office and I would apply to jobs all the time. And the preference was always Holyoke. And like I told you, the last company, right? And I could only go off of what I've seen. So with all due respect to you, sir, and to all these company and industry reps in here, I can only go off of what I've seen when that one company did a major job fair and they've committed to hiring local and yet are still asking us to come through the doors and go door knocking for them, right? They're not paying me or my staff to go do that, but we're gonna do that because the neighborhood needs employment, right? Or how many of your companies have just online applications, right? We had to request, and I'm very grateful to GTI, they gave us paper copies of their applications because everything is in this online digital world, but how many people from the neighborhood have access to computers or laptops? Right? We have this high performance computing center, wonderful, with no computer labs or centers for the community to access. And we're trying to build that, but those, and, and preference is great. That's a coded language for, yeah, we would prefer to hire everyone who's in need, but how are we really getting there? So I would really like to see more concrete. So preference is a term I don't want to see. I want to see concrete numbers and percentages because if 20, 25%, even if it's 30 of them, that's life changing. And we have examples of it working with demented effects. They sign a local host community agreement with the neighborhood. Out of their 40 scares, 25 come from the two neighborhoods surrounding it. So every year during the Halloween season, when I walk through that dang scary haunted house, people are saying my name directly. That creeps me out even more so because I don't know who the hell they are. But we have proof that you can do better than just preference. You could put a percentage, you could put a number. If you know there's 25, I could commit to 10 being from this community or five or seven and that's life changing. Thank you. So I just also want to be clear that career point was just an example. So uh, we're going to work with all community organizations to make sure that we do uh, hire local people. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lisi. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Attorney Farad, I'm looking at your response to question number seven. And um, it's about the, the traffic. <laughs> and I feel that this, um, so th you propose that like a guard could assist, but then say it may, it's probably unnecessary. And I think that the, I, I agree that the, there, there's no need for a guard. Um, but I do think that what we've seen in the past is uh, paintings and markings on the ground that direct traffic. Um, like when you, you know, go in and out of uh, entrance and egress areas, there's an arrow pointing in, arrow pointing out, yellow paint to show like where the lanes are perhaps. Um, and I'm not sure if the, what the condition of the pavement in that area is, like if, if there's a need for it to be repaved in order to do the markings, or if you think at this point that um, there's a way to do markings and directional paintings. Uh, so I, I'm sure there's a need to do some uh, patching before that's done, yeah. but uh, 
uh, you know, until there's a permit, I don't think we uh, will hire somebody to go out and give us a quote on how much needs to be replaced and filled in. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's work that needs to be done on the pavement before it's painted. Mm -hmm. And it, so, it certainly will be painted, though, and, and brightly uh, with arrows and yellow and lanes marked. Yeah, I think that um, getting a commitment on the paintings and markings is, is um, much more appealing to me than even the guard. I, I don't know if the guard is, is necessary, unless the guard is there for security reasons related to the security of the building, not so much the, the, the security of the parking lot or the directional um, guide that... that that I think you're proposing here? No, so um, we think, so th right at the beginning of the answer to question seven, the use of a guard to assist with parking may be unnecessary. Uh, and we, we do think that for 99.9% .9 of the time, it'll be unnecessary. But if it is necessary, then the security person who's at the door would be able to see out that there's a traffic issue, mm -hmm. come out and say, you know, come this way, go that way. So it would n absolutely not be a dedicated guard in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, and I do want to reiterate that I think that the, the paintings and markings are going to be essential um, in, in order to mitigate any traffic issues on the property and then coming in and out of the property, because it is, it is uh, a, a fairly dense collection of buildings and it may be confusing to people coming in which building they, they want to go to and it may interfere with the um, business activities in those other buildings if, if there isn't some sort of clear delineation of where to go and how to get in. We agree 100%. So that's why uh, on the dispensary building, which is about, I'm guessing, 100 feet off of Dwight Street, There'll be a sign, very tasteful sign. I always call it the Yankee Candle sign. So it says Yankee Provision Store. And then this is actually the pump house building that's closer to Dwight Street. So these are two different buildings. This one's about 100 feet back. This one's about 25 feet back. So when you drive down uh, or come up Dwight Street, you're going to see can of provisions parking with an arrow. and. So people will, instead of going this way in front of the pump house, they'll go this way, and there'll be yellow paint here with an arrow going in, an arrow coming out, and so that's how traffic will be directed 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Questions, please. Let me make sure my microphone is on so nobody can say they didn't hear me. Last call for public comment, pro or con? Questions, counselors, committee members? Not seeing any. Um, Councilor Bartley. I just have a couple of questions for the law department. Um, under suspension, Crystal, uh, um, two, two things. One is when, when we close the public hearing, can you just remind us of the the time constraint that so we we have to the, the full board has to the full council I should say has to vote how many days from the date of the close of the public hearing um, I want to say it's 65 but that might be wrong it's 60 it's either either 60 or 65 I think it's 65. okay Or 60, Joe, you, do you know off the top of your head? So the hearing has to be held within 65 days after it's okay. submitted, which we did. Okay. And then after the close of the public hearing, um, planning board has 21 days to do their response. And then it has to be acted on within 90 days. So not, it is planning a special board has permit. No role on this one. Huh? Planning, planning board doesn't. Not involved in this. Planning one. board is not involved oh. in this. Then we don't have to worry about the 21 days. 
So you have to hold within so um, 90 days. Hang on. Public hearing has to be held within 65 days after the application is filed with the clerk, which we did. Um, after we close the public hearing, when does it? You have to do final action within 90 days. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Even though it's a special permit and not a zone change? Yeah, it's under the, it's uh, Master Knowledge Chapter 48, Section 9 oh. and... 90 days. Okay, 90, 90 days. days. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, Chris, I have one, one other question. Um, you heard our discussion about hours of operation and 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 then the applicant pointed out the the city ordinance which you know I'll defer to the applicant I just I don't remember it but I, I know we had a discussion last year when we were writing the ordinances and I believe the applicant said eight to eight seven days a week can and I'm not saying I'm gonna do it just I'm asking the question so it, though we have an ordinance that says a certain certain days of the week and certain times of the day, can this board make a condition on a special permit that would be valid to alter, to another to supersede that? So, in other words, could I say uh, Monday through Saturday eight to eight, or could I say some other Seven other days. other days of the week and hours of the day besides what's written in the ordinance, and and have that as a condition on a, on a permit I mean if you have an ordinance that already that would be odd I don't know that you couldn't but that would be odd to have an ordinance and then limit it further than the ordinance but but the answer is yes so well I, I mean I it's it's I'm not saying I'm gonna do it I'm just I just want to get the you know what, what are my options available and, and you heard a discussion by the Ward 2 counselor who was who was who was when he was here? He was he was bringing up a few of the issues about about uh, traffic and those those sorts of concerns. So that's why I raise it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right, and Crystal, just to follow up on Councilor Bartley's point, if theoretically there were concerns raised about impacts on the quality of life in a particular neighborhood, it seems that we would have some discretion under a special permit. I'm not saying this that exists here, but I just think that's why we issue them. We often restrict hours and days that are available by ordinance for businesses. I mean, we do that all the time. So, I mean, I think this is the same, but I, I don't think we've heard those other than we did hear Council Roman just now, but anyway, that's what we've done in the past. Could we oh, just hear oh, from sure, Marcos? Sorry. Well, just to provide my two cents on that question, um, I, I believe you have the discretion to do so. I think what would be important, because you're following Chapter 48, you're the special permit granting authority under zoning law for use, that you have a finding that backs up Correct. the reason why Correct. you're restricting a particular applicant's hours of operation so that it's not arbitrary and capricious, because that exactly. could come back to, to bite us. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have a series of these applications um, the perception that the city of Holyoke is being fair, which doesn't have to mean that everyone's treated equally, but that with the same bar is going to be important. So if it's not eight to eight, then there should be a clear reason that's backed up with facts or evidence as to why it shouldn't be eight to eight or other days. Yeah. I, would certainly, I would certainly defer to your lawyer, but I would also suggest that those facts would need to come from members of the public at the microphone. Respectfully. Right, right, yeah. Respectfully. That's suggested. the whole point of the public hearing. Oh, Jack, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, no, no, Jack, obviously I respect everything you say, but in, in, in that regard, um, as the elected representatives of, of the people, whether or not they walk up to the microphone, I, I, don't, I don't consider that to be relevant. But I would just point out uh, Section 9.3.3, .3, conditions under special permits. So I do agree with what Marco said. Special permits may be granted with such reasonable conditions, safeguards, or limitations on time or use. So, so, so I, I, I mean, I think I knew the answer to my question anyhow. I just wanted to hear it. So I, I felt like that that we, we can make a reasonable condition on a special permit. So if certain counselors want to say oh, we're really not psyched about Sundays, that perhaps we could, we could put that as a conditional special permit. I would also say to you and to your app, your, your client, that 
if over the course of time conditions change, you can always reapply and, and, for, and, and we can potentially amend the permit. So, and as I said initially, this is a brave new world. None of us gets it, including the Commonwealth. And so we're, we're just trying to do our best to muddle through. And um, so I'll leave it at that. Not seeing any other people who wish to speak in the public hearing. What is the pleasure of the committee? Um, I'm going to motion that we close the public hearing. Is there a second? All in favor? Uh, so discussion? Just, just oh, so, sure. Just, yeah, sure. Just be clear. So we, we, I think we heard from, so we have 90 days from July 7th, so August, September, October. So we're, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, well, at least four city full city council meetings in which to make a, take a vote. Um, but we're going to have to go into discussion for, for some of the issues that I want to raise that, that I have a motion any that I don't think we're on any kind of mode to, uh, to deal well, with to deal with them we tonight. We don't have to. If I, if I may, I think in the interest of time and all the people that are here yeah. to be heard, we can close the public hearing. At yeah. a future meeting, we will take up okay. the item. I appreciate for that. conditions, discussion, etc. Right. I don't see us doing that tonight. All right, and Jack, you you you, you have no, no other further. You think we have client? everything? We have, right, we have everything we need. We need and everything that you. Yes, you do. Okay. We're required. <laughs> so I'll. I'll so uh, then, on the motion to close the public hearing, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, motion to take number six off the table. To continue. And continue the public hearing, take number six off the table. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item six, public hearing for petition of George Tiersay, Farms, oh, I'm, the organization is Farms of Gloversville, New York, to operate an RMRE and a MMD for medical and recreational marijuana purposes at 630 Beaulieu Street, Holyoke, Mass. Hello. Good evening, Madam Chairman. I'm, I'm Richard Evans. I'm an attorney in uh, Northampton, and, and this is George Terrace, your applicant. I hope you received all the questions that were remaining. I have the questions okay. that were, uh, were raised before our last hearing, and I think we addressed all of them. I inquired recently as to any outstanding ones, and didn't didn't learn of any but we're here to I didn't receive new questions after the last hearing personally so you should be aware of them okay so are there do you want to hear a summary update on the questions from the applicant or well, well wherever, wherever he is I don't know it's up to attorney Evans so if you would just want to give us the highlights of the remaining questions I don't think there was a long long list Yes, I'd be pleased to. Uh, there were about ten questions. The first, the first related to the uh, proposed use, whether it was an RMD, re a registered marijuana dispensary, exactly what the nature of the of the uh, operation would be, and the answer is that it will be an MMD, a medical marijuana dispensary, an RMRE and this is the terms under the Holyoke uh, bylaw, that's a recreational marijuana retail establishment, and an MME, which is a marijuana manufacturing establishment. That's what my client hopes to operate. Right, the second question right? had to do with the um, uh, management of refuge, refuse, and uh, we, we, our engineer responded in a, a long letter of June 12th, I think that's in your file, mm -hmm. uh, describing the dumpster area and the, the security surrounding the dumpster and all that. Um, the uh, question three related to a uh, trash enclosure and, uh, and our, our engineer responded with a summary of the procedures including a description of a, of a chain link fence uh, for security and a solid wall. Um, question four related to an improvements plan. Would we consider adding any landscaping and shrubs? And the answer is certainly we do propose to make the area as attractive as possible, but not 
however, uh, uh, jeopardizing any security. We don't want to put bushes up that would give someone a place to hide. Uh, question five had to do with the parking, and, and uh, we pointed out in the response, or our engineer did, that there's an existing parking lot and we're going to bring it up to snuff, and that should not really pose any parking problems at all, because there's quite ample parking on the site. Question six related to um, exactly the capacity of the parking, and the answer is uh, 26 uh, or 27 spaces are provided. Uh, question seven related to uh, sidewalks and ramps, and, uh, and, and our response is that the, the ramps are all going to be ADA compliant. Uh, question eight related to stormwater, um, and, and uh, we received a uh, letter from the city engineer indicating that the project exempt, is exempt from the stormwater regulation process. Question nine related to uh, windows, and that is uh, what they were going to look like. And, and we're going to design the, the windows are there, and they will, they will have graphics in them that will be attractive. Uh, and they'll have security measures on the inside. The graphics may be of a person looking out or a plant or something like that. Uh, but it will be well designed and attractive. And the final or question 10 was relating to the same thing, the windows, and we responded to that. And then question 11 as to signs, we are going to use the existing signs, uh, actually shrink the existing sign that's there uh, the, for Gold, Gold Car, I think was the name of the company. Uh, so there won't be any new or larger signage than we have now. And uh, we provided a graphic indicating exactly what the sign was gonna look like. And uh, the, 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 let's see, the final question was 13, um, which says if there are any proposed changes, that we would be expected to come back. And indeed, we note that, and we will, in fact, if we do develop changes to this plan. Thank you. And Those we do the, have that in the file. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Bartley. So uh, thank you, Attorney Evans. Thank you for being coming back here again. We really appreciate it. Um, so. As I said to all the other applicants, I have four or five things I just wanted to mention to you that I'm going to motion for each each applicant. Uh, I, I think you heard what there was. I'll just I'll briefly just run run through them because I think you've been here for you know since 6:30, so you've heard the whole thing. Um, that just to, just remind us who, who's who owns the building and which which. It's owned by an LLC named uh, Gold Car LLC, and Mr. Uh, uh, Silverberg, I think, is Goldenberg. Goldenberg. I'm sorry, Robert Goldenberg is the owner of the building. Okay, and is he a related party? No, no, he's just the landlord. Just the landlord. Okay, Mr. Goldenberg. Okay. So, to, to the extent I can, Attorney Evans, and you know, under under law, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll get whatever language you have to put in there to to make it all. You know, read properly to the extent we can under law. I'm going to try to make a condition I'll say one thing. that in, in, I'll say, in which I'll say that one the thing. property owner, whether it's a related party or whether it's a lessor, remains a for-profit entity. That there, that your your client would would not lease space from a non-profit entity, and or otherwise the the the, the, the permit would be revoked. So. It, and why am I saying that? Well, because we, in the past, and I've only been on this board six and a half years, so it hasn't been my whole life. But I, while on this board, my early time on the board, we gave away a couple, three tips, uh, tax increment financing. They all sound great on paper, um, except for the fact that these long-term non-paying tax, non-paying entities, they just don't pay any property tax. So, so I, 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 I want, Again, if, and if it's filed invalid under, after some kind of litigation, which I, I bet you're not gonna find it invalid under state law because there is no state law in point and there's no federal law in point. I don't care what Attorney Ferrer intimated because he can't find it because it doesn't exist. And you can try to litigate it, but knock yourself out with that. I'm gonna to try to the extent I can ensure that it's always be a tax paying entity that serves as host to this, what hopefully will be a very profitable, and I, I hope you make, you know, knock the ball out of the park, make a lot of money, but the city's got to get its property taxes 
Uh, it, ju it just has to, Attorney Evans. So that, that's one condition. I think it's a very valid point, uh, Councillor Bartley. And I would add that the host agreement actually contemplates this possibility by ha containing language saying that in the event that the property where we're operating becomes owned by a nonprofit and goes off the tax rolls, then we'll pay the taxes. We'll pay the difference. Oh, it's in there already. Yeah, that's even better. And I, it's yeah. not, and I already admitted I haven't seen the host agreement. I, it may have been sent. I just don't have it. Uh, I, it's not my email yet, but I'm sure Marco's been very, I'll have it by tomorrow. So th that'll be great. Sure. Um, I, I mentioned, um, should there be a need for um, a, a security employment that we give a preference to, um, to e either an off duty or a, a retired, um, member of the Holy police force that non-security employment that we give we you heard that discussion to hope preference whatever the strongest possible language you can have is reasonable under state law that we give a preference to Holyoke residents whether there's a carve out or not I, I don't know what he has but that's you know we didn't talk about for this meeting but but there's got to be some kind of a preference for for Holyoke residents since we're, we're bearing the yeah, we're, we're, we're bearing the burden of it. So, and, and we have made that commitment as part of the Coast Agreement as well. And if you want to toughen that language up uh, without constricting who they can, you know, uh, uh, who, who they can hire, uh, then um, no, we, who they reason. must hire. Yeah, within reason, of course. I understand that, yes. Mr. Evans. Yeah, sure. so we'll, we'll say that. Yeah. And then the, the last one I think we talked about, or I talked about, is, is the uh, you know, non-consumption non on, on, on premises. So that's, that's one thing I... And again, if you if you look at the if you look at the ordinance 933, which I know you have, I mean it's pretty broad language. So um, whether that's been challenged elsewhere, I, I don't I don't know. But uh, I think that language stands up on its own, and that gives us a fair amount of flexibility. Now I'm just one vote, uh, but I'm hopeful that I can persuade some of the, my colleagues that these are reasonable. If we pay taxes, if we don't consume our premises, if we get we get preferences to the Holyoke Police and to Holyoke residents. I, I, I think those are reasonable conditions and I hope your client would, would agree. But I, I, you know, this is your time now in the public hearing to give us the feedback. because once we shut it down, once we'll close the public hearing, you know, as you know, that's Attorney Evans, that's kind of the tail of the tape. So we just do our deliberation. Yes, okay? uh, and again, I think uh, the, the, there is a regulation, one of the CCC regulations is that there shall be no consumption of cannabis products on the premises of a licensed marijuana establishment. Now, the only prospective exception to that rule would be if a retailer applied for and obtained a social consumption license. Now, a social consumption license is one that's held by a, by a retailer. Now, the regs don't allow that. The state regs don't allow that now. They, they took that off the table a couple of months ago and said they would re-examine the prospect of social consumption and may revisit it. There may be issues some new regs in, the, uh, in October or so. But as of right now, the, the regulations absolutely forbid all consumption on licensed uh, premises. And I'm now, talking about you might say, casual consumption as opposed to right. so quote, social so consumption. As I confessed earlier on, I, I didn't have that site, and I think you heard one of the applicants who's not an attorney say he's going to get it to me, but I, I have more confidence in you getting If you could send that site to Mr. Allen, I'm sure you've been in communication with our administrative assistant, and he can, if not, you can see my, my emails on the city website, and you could contact me, and I'll, I'll get it to Mr. Allen. I'd be happy so, to do that. Thank you, thank Mr. You, sir. Thank you, sir. So I just, I just want to ask one question to Marcos. Is there anything, it seems like we have a fairly complete file here, but to your knowledge, is there anything else that we should be considering um, that we have not touched on they've, from your point of view? They've clearly answered all of, all of our questions and concerns. I just want to uh, clarify or, or offer some information on the, on the concerns presented. Um, by the nature of the special permit that you're approving, you're approving only manufacturing on the site. So even if state law changed as far as, you know, tomorrow they can issue licenses for on-site consumption and this company or any company were to apply for them, they would still have to come back to this body for that. So just by the nature of your approval, it is restricted to what they've applied for, which is manufacturing. So uh, just uh, hoping to, to, to explain that it is constrained to their application and they cannot consume socially on the site. They're applying for manufacturing. Even if they're applying for the other categories? 
Wait, they're yeah, only... They, they have, they're under applying. the RMD that they're applying for, they're looking for the MMD, Medical Marijuana Dispensary, the RMRE. Recreational. Recreational Marijuana re Retail Establishment Action. and MME. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So... I don't have the application right in front of me. <laughs> Council Bartley? Yeah, just just on point, I, and and I, and I know Attorney Evans is going to send me the the the, uh, the site, but I would also suggest to you, Marcos, and to the applicant, that <laughs> if the state law, which we have obviously no control over, if that became less restrictive, so for example, if they all of a sudden change the state laws, change the cannabis regulations to allow consumption on site, right. it's my understanding that if a municipal ordinance is stronger than a state law than the municipal ordinance though it's a juxtaposition the sure. municipal ordinance would be preeminent so if we have if we have a more restrictive ordinance Correct. than the combo so therefore i would still probably go ahead and make that motion right. to restrict the uh, on site Correct. and i would only amend what i said so my, my apologies even though the ca they've applied for the category because they would be selling um, that your approval would be of the what they're applying for. So if their representation in their application is that they would not have on-site consumption and you approve that, they would not be entitled to on-site consumption later on because it's not one of the conditions in their special permit. So I, th I think what you're saying is kind of reinforcing what there, it is in the application. Okay, so it wouldn't be contradictory. <laughs> All right, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not screwing up too much. So okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good to go. Okay. Councilor Lisi. Thanks, and I just wanted to add that I filed... Um, one order at least to explore ways of adopting um, state provisions for the social consumption and I think in, in the same vein if the state changed its regulations we would then have to adopt um, those state regulations locally so if, if there was some sort of local pro I'm sorry state provision for the social consumption then the state has to adopt that locally before we could even allow for the permitting in the same way that we just created local ordinances to allow for the permitting of these licenses that are now legal at the state level. Right. Uh, correct. So what happens is that th there's there's a gray area right now at the state level where the Cannabis Control Commission has uh, has put a freeze basically on on licensing for on-site consumption. Mm -hmm. So even when the state puts it on a path, so that may be we need to do a ballot initiative or they just may say no it's all fine everyone can do it you're still going to have to permit them individually so if this company or any other company says tomorrow okay we want to amend our plan we want to have on-site consumption they're going to have to come back to the council to amend their special permit for that purpose mm -hmm. yeah um so that that's the first thing i wanted to say um and then secondly i just i want to uh, applaud the work that attorney evans and mr tears you, you've done um both on the application that you provided us in terms of addressing um, the questions and details that we need to, to make um, a sound decision. And I think if Councillor uh, Nelson Roman was here, um, he'd applaud you as well as on, on the uh, community outreach efforts that you've done that have been um, very successful. So um, just thank you for your efforts on, on, mm -hmm. in that, in that mm -hmm. case. Okay, um, is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak in favor or against this permit? Not seeing any. I don't see any other questions or concerns from councilors. Councilor Bartley. So just before, because I think we, I think you know what we're going to do in a second. So, Attorney Evans, did you want to add any anything else for any while you have a chance? I would like to ask the uh, the committee to make a finding that that we meet the criteria laid out in not only in 732 of the zoning bylaw but also in 7107 of the marijuana bylaw and I want to say that as much as uh, this committee and the leadership of this town uh, wants to see this new industry help revive the community my client wants to be part of that process as well so we join you in this effort and thank you very much for your courtesy so I'll, yeah. I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing second, second. all in favor aye, aye. Thank we you. will entertain discussion and conditions etc at a future meeting thank you thank you okay. I need a motion uh, madam chair <laughs> can we can we leave seven on the table? I, I'm yes, just really just, it's your order. <laughs> yeah, I know it's my order. Can, can we just take it? I really appreciate putting it on there, but all right, this is it's a lot. To be. Thank you. 
Motion to take up item number eight. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item eight, order that the salary ordinance for pay scales for non-union employees who've worked for the city for a minimum of 10 years and have not received a raise as confirmed by the treasurer in the past 10 years be increased by 3% so that these employees may receive a pay increase. Um, hang on one second. I believe over the last few years we've had discussions about the 40 some odd people who hadn't had a raise and relative to the salary study. So I had filed the order talking about 10 years not having a raise, which has been what has been the core group. And I received from the auditor, at, which was in response to a request from Councilor McGee, those who had not had an increase for five years. So interestingly, over the years, a number of things have changed. So as of tonight, there are only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten employees who are in that category of being stuck within the limits of the ordinance. Now interestingly, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight of those employees work for the library, which we just assumed as, as, as employees of the city in the last five years. So they may not have had increases in a longer period of time, but their whole structure of their employment changed. Um, within that time period. So if we were to, um, if the committee wanted to recommend and the council adopted my order as written, it would include one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of the people on the list. And I'm happy to pass it around. I'm not keeping it a secret. No. I'm just. So, are you saying <laughs> that I just got an email and I printed it? <laughs> the ten individuals that are listed here are um, basically the ten that have capped out of the current ordinance. Is that what you're right. saying? Mm -hmm. um, if I if I may continue. Well, uh, sure. Yeah. So. I, I am a big proponent, I'm just going to put it out there, of the salary study and adopting the recommendations of the salary study, which is now several years old. And so I, don't, I think that the salary study brought us up to 50% um, of a competitive rate for um, equivalent positions in this community and, and other um, similar cities in terms of size and population and things like that. Um, so I don't know if a 3% raise on the current cap for those 10 uh, individuals is, is coming near the competitive rate. And I am really all about bringing our city employees up to a competitive rate of pay because I think we have been losing so many city hall employees um, that we're not... We're not retaining people. We have a high level of attrition, and I think we want to attract and retain talent in order to let the city thrive. So I, I would have to actually see how the 3% increase compares to the numbers that we saw were the 50% equivalents of the... Um, uh, well, you can, you can take a picture of that if you want, and you can see how it compares. Um, just by way of informing the committee, um, from the auditor's department, this was addressed to Todd McGee and copied to me that he had requested the list of employees. And what they stated is the attached list shows the specific employees who have not received any increase for at least five years. The original list of 40 employees has dwindled significantly as several employees have moved to the professional supervisors union and others have left. The other employees of the city have received increases per union contracts with the most recent percent increase and date of increase indicated in the attached. So things have changed since the salary study. The salary study was taken up in committee timely. It was brought to the city council where it was tabled. It was subsequently returned to city council. Since then, the mayor set up a whole contract agreement with people, put certain people in, kept certain people out. These are the remaining people who have received nothing. My order is to give them something. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think it is blatantly unfair that these few people have received nothing. And 
I'm not saying what I'm suggesting is a perfect fix, but the employees that I've talked to have told me that they would find it to be much better than nothing. So I don't think you know they're going so purist on the salary study at this point. They would just like to see, and this isn't gonna guarantee them a raise anyway. This is just gonna make it possible. It's not gonna make it happen. So, yeah. but I appreciate your comments. I think, but I just wanna make it really clear that I think that if we're going to be increasing the salaries for a handful of employees, I think it's worthwhile to, um, I mean, 3% seems somewhat arbitrary, you know, because if it's like a COLA for the past 10 years, it should be 3% times 10, right? That, that would be a COLA. Um, anyhow, I, I would like to see what 3% turns out to be in terms of like a salary increase vis-a-vis um, the salary study projections, which I think are going to be much more on par with a, a market rate um, base of comp compensation. Well, I would just note that all the people that are not, I'm not talking about elected people here, um, they have worked for the city for a minimum of seven years. So this is not a high turnover group, but this is these are people who should have the opportunity to have some kind of a raise. Everybody else got a work around. We sat, I objected vehemently to the six, seven, and eight percent raises that got given to certain people. If this is a fairness issue. Give them something. We can maybe make it better later, but these 11 people shouldn't be the only people who get nothing. It's just not right. So that's my opinion, and I hope the committee will support something or some variation of this. I'm happy to table it for tonight because I know we're all tired, <laughs> but um, I would hope, um, and even if you wanted to be more inclusive and you know, give it to all, I'd be happy to amend my order to include the people who hadn't had a raise in five years because there's a couple people here that have been here seven, eight, and yeah, two people that were here seven and eight years have had no increase. So, you know, if you want to say five, but I'm not including, I would not include any elected official because our practice has always been to change the pay of an elect. You run for the office, you know what the pay is. Yeah. That's the deal. So, but, Council Bartley? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, with any of this r right now. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to vote on it and, and support it and just move it off our, our agenda so we can move it forward to the, to the full board. Okay. Um, so whether you want to, I mean, the, the, the employees that were five years and over with without a raise, just a, so we would just be adjusting the ordinance for each of these positions? Yep. Uh, and could the chair just enumerate the, how many, what, what, what do we got here? Okay. Just, are there? Okay, so I would um, actually offer an amendment to my order that says, um, that the salary ordinance for pay scales for non-union, non-elected employees who have worked for the city for a minimum of five years and have not received a raise um, have that job classification increased by 3%. I'll second that. Um, the people who would be included are a person who's an assistant to the mayor. Mm -hmm. Um, a person who is in the auditor's department. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people who work in the library whose pay currently ranges from $21,146 to $35,053. An administrative assistant in the fire department and a person in the police department that appears to be administrative or something. Sure. Yeah. Um, so those would be the categories that would be affected. No, I, I second it. Okay. okay, so Council Lisi. So I just wanna make, make clear, like I absolutely believe that these individuals deserve a raise. My contention is that I think a 3% raise may be selling these employees short vis-a-vis -vis the salary study. And I think that if we're going to be making increases that they should be based on 
data as opposed to the arbitrary 3% that's, that's thrown out here. Um, and that's just where I'm at. And I'm not ready to make a decision until I understand what that 3% translates to vis-a-vis -vis the salary study. I just want to know what the, what the numbers are so I could compare them. Um, and, and that's really where I'm at on this. You want to speak? Councilor Anderson Burgos? Yeah, I think maybe we should um, take some time, maybe table it, and then discuss, uh, do a little research, as you were saying, and then take some time with this. Make a motion to table it. Again, it just seems like we have some information out there that's not in hand tonight. Um, and I'd like to know what the 3% looks like compared to the salary study that, that was done for these positions. The, the salary study at this point is about what, four or five years old. So maybe your 3% so is... The 3% is to simply give people who have received nothing something. And hopefully the economic condition of the city improves enough that we can do better by them. There have been people who have received exorbitant raises. And to use the salary study as maybe this isn't enough, so I'm not going to give any, I just find as a faulty argument. So um, I'm going to vote no on the motion to table. I hope I will be joined by at least one other person. <laughs> um, on that, but there is the motion to table before us, which is not debatable. So, on the motion to table, all in favor? Yes. All opposed? No. no. So, on the order as amended and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No. All opposed? No. So, we then, it fails to be recommended to the City Council, so I guess we put it forth without a recommendation. And you don't have a, a legal opinion either. That would give you the legal language in order to adopt it. So, Crystal, I guess we have to ask you to put it in legal form and put it forth with no recommendation from the committee. But I think that you have to have this committee vote to put it into legal form. I think she's right. I, I don't know. I, we've never had that before. We've recommended many things out without a recommendation from committees, and we didn't have to vote on legal form. No, what we've done in the past is um, we have... Other committees I'm talking about. But no other committee has the ability to re request a legal form. It's the ordinance committee that is the only committee that has the ability to request something be put into a legal form and then put before the city council. We have had things in legal form that were recommended for denial by a minority group and approval of, or and vice versa in the past. I mean, we've had them put forth in various situations in the past. But the committee voted to put multiple recommendations before the full council. Not that we've, not that a losing opinion or losing proposition was put into a legal form. It was just the vote of the committee to put multiple forms out in a legal form so that they could be considered by the full council and there were options. Here, that's not the case. Checking the rules. This is different. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. So rule 37 says a draft of the adoption amendment or deletion of an ordinance to be a report to be reported to the city council by the committee on ordinance whether reported by a majority or a minority of said committee shall first be submitted by the committee to the city solicitor for examine and approval uh, as to form and legal character uh, so it would be a minority request well, in this case it's two to two so I mean, I. 
or we can table. No, I mean, I, I think we I took. A, I, I think we took a vote. And right, it's two two. Listen, if if if. if and if the whole city council if, if, doesn't if, want to give a letter yeah, to people, vote, 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 vote against it. You need two thirds. You need two thirds anyhow. Uh, I mean, my argument is going to be that they. Um, Why would you need two thirds? The ordinance change. No. No. Just a majority. Just a majority. Only two thirds for. Just for zone and oh, great. special permit, right? Oh, and great. financial transfers on the first reading. Oh, great. Okay, so um, then matter. we can consider it a request, a minority request for legal form for as amended for item eight. Crystal? I'm still reading. <laughs> um, yeah, I can put it into um, legal form and then I think it still goes out without a recommendation. Right. But. No, so. Okay, thank you. So the ruling by the chair was right, okay. So I'll motion to adjourn. I try to know my rules. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Sure. Sure. You know what I'll do? Well,